And I call on the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and to move the motion. Today, the Scottish Parliament votes to set all rates and bans for Scottish income tax. This is our opportunity to use the powers of this Parliament to build a fairer, more prosperous country and put our progressive values into action. In November, we published the income tax discussion paper, which set out four tests that we believe any income tax policy change it must meet. This civic engagement was well received and allowed for constructive engagement in the tax setting process. Our four tests were to help maintain and promote the level of public services which people in Scotland expect, ensure the lowest earning taxpayers do not see their taxes increase, ensure any tax changes make the tax system more progressive and reduce inequality, and along with our decisions on spending, support the wider economy. I'm clear that the proposals before you today do indeed pass those four tests, and I'm asking the Scottish Parliament to agree with my motion, which for the tax year 1819 will raise an extra £219 million to invest in public services, tackle poverty and support Scotland's economy, and protect those on low incomes, making the system fairer and more progressive. The new starter rate, combined with an increase in the personal allowance, will result in 70% of all income taxpayers paying less tax than they do this year on current incomes. Uh, this means that no one who earns less than £33,000 will pay more than they did last year. And more than half of taxpayers will pay less than if they lived in the rest of the UK. Those proposals mean that for the majority, Scotland will be the lowest tax part of the UK. Of course, Murdo Fraser. Thank you. I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Would you like to take this opportunity to apologise to the 898,000 basic rate taxpayers in Scotland who perhaps believed the SNP's manifesto commitment not to increase the tax they were paying and were conned into voting for them as a result? Will he apologise? Cabinet Secretary. A majority of basic rate taxpayers will pay less tax under this government's proposition. And I'm sure that they would welcome that. And I don't know why Murdo Fraser objects to Scotland being the lowest tax part of the UK. That is, of course, that is, of course, because it's not taxation for the richest in society, which clearly seems to be the only interest of the Tory party. The richest in society and those vested interests is who the Tories represent. As I've said, no one who earns less than £33,000 will pay more than they did last year. And more than half of taxpayers will pay less than if they lived in the rest of the UK. As I've said, this makes Scotland the lowest tax part of the UK. They were surprised by that on the 14th of December, and the Tories are still surprised by that fact. But I'll take an intervention uh, from the Labour Party. Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And on that point, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he doesn't think it would be fairer and bolder to ask the wealthiest to pay more tax in this country so that we can actually begin to tackle child poverty? Cabinet Secretary. You see, what I would say in reply to Elaine Smith is that's exactly what this government is doing. That's exactly what we're doing. However, in contrast to what the Labour Party is proposing, by doing it in a proper fashion, we will actually raise the revenue to invest in public services. Rather than allow for tax behaviours, will it mean less resource for the next year. That's the reality. As as verified by SPICE, the Fiscal Commission and the Council of Economic Advisers. I think the Labour Party should do their homework when it comes to tax setting in this country with the powers that we have. The tax decisions that I have taken have enabled me to reverse the real terms cut that has been imposed by the UK Government on our resource budget and continue to invest in our public services and our people and our businesses enabling them to develop and thrive. We are a parliament of minorities and must work across the chamber to find compromise and consensus so that we can give support, sustainability and stimulus to our economy and our public services. Now, reaching consensus is indeed a task for us all and I thank those members who have engaged properly and constructively. Since the Scottish Parliament gained powers over income tax, this government has been completely clear in its ambition that income tax should be fair and progressive, whilst also supporting 
the delivery of vital public services and enabling investment in the economy. Overall, the Scottish Government's use of the devolved income tax powers will deliver an additional £428 million next year to support a budget that will protect our public services that are free at the point of use, including free prescriptions, free personal care and free tuition. We will invest an additional £400 million in Scotland's National Health Service and will provide above inflation investment in the police, in our universities and colleges and in local government services the length and breadth of Scotland. And I'm confident that these proposals will deliver the best outcomes for the people and the economy of Scotland, the best deal anywhere in the UK. Now, tax powers are not a political toy. They have an impact on individuals and the economy. And the decisions that this government has made has to be seen in the context of the UK government's continued pursuit of budget cuts and the harmful effects that this has had on Scottish government funding. What this means is that those Scottish taxpayers with the broadest shoulders are being asked to contribute more to support investment in Scotland's people and Scotland's economy. We must also keep in mind that no one for a given income will see their income tax increase by more than 1% of their gross salary next year. Yet collectively, these changes will raise an additional £219 million for investment in our economy and our public services. Those desperate to present these changes as a major risk to Scotland's economy are simply wrong. The Scottish Fiscal Commission has stated the tax impact on the economy will be negligible. The tax an individual pays is only one part of the equation. Not only is there a direct benefit to the individual in being able to access a broad range of quality public services, there is a wider benefit, both now and for the future, from the investment that this budget is making. The current devolved income tax powers are indeed significant. However, as decisions over the income tax base remain reserved to Westminster, their use is either constrained or could result in unavoidable consequences impacting on Scottish taxpayers. My officials and I have been working with HMRC to ensure that any administrative consequences are resolved. And to this end, I have reached agreement with the UK Government that Scottish taxpayers paying the starter or intermediate rates of tax will retain their eligibility for marriage allowance. The UK Government confirmed yesterday that Scottish taxpayers will continue to receive pensions relief and other allowances on the same basis as the rest of UK taxpayers. Of course, this would be easier if Scotland had full powers over income tax. Future revenues, no interventions despite the, the noise coming from the Tory benches. Future, future revenues for the Scottish Government will be driven by both our policy choices and by the relative growth per capita in our tax receipts. This is why this government continues to invest in Scotland's economy and its workforce to improve the prospects for economic and employment growth. Indeed, this investment will come at a time when Scotland's economic performance has remained resilient despite heightened economic uncertainty as the UK moves closer to leaving the EU. It is encouraging that the latest Bank of Scotland PMI reported that business optimism in Scotland is at a three-year high. In addition, Scotland is also benefiting from continued near-record low unemployment, demonstrating the ongoing strength of the Scottish labour market. As well as our four tests, we followed the Adam Smith tax-making principles of certainty, convenience, ease of collection and proportionality to the ability to pay. Delivering certainty over income tax policy was raised as an important issue during a series of roundtable events. We recognise the importance of certainty to Scottish taxpayers and to business. The income tax discussion paper marked our intent to debate and reach a decision over income tax arrangements, which will be fit for purpose now and into the future. The proposed income tax policy meets the four tests and the Adam Smith principles, and I believe we have a settled structure in income tax policy and should provide certainty over the remainder of this Parliament. The Independent Scottish Fiscal Commission is responsible for forecasting Scottish income tax receipts, and this determines 
the funding available from HM Treasury in 2018-19. Their forecasts show that there will be growth in Scottish income tax receipts for every year over the forecast period, and the forecast per capita growth is expected to be greater than that in the rest of the UK. I will. Who's Thank Kelly. the Cabinet Secretary for taking that intervention. Will Cabinet Secretary confirm that the government are able to submit their own forecasts in re relation to income tax receipts and therefore uh, change the amount that's been deducted uh, from the Scottish budget by the Scottish Fiscal Commission? Cabinet Secretary. HM Treasury it will only release for the Scottish Government to draw down what the SFC has forecast as the appropriate amount. That's the reality. That's the guidance. A government with the best will in the world can't just make up the amount of resource it would like to have. It's the resource the SFC has said is the appropriate amount. So it's that mechanism that drives what the Scottish Government has at its disposal. So even though the Labour Party, with all the other mistakes and inadequacies in it, even though there was an alternative budget, can't escape the fact that Treasury will only give us resources on the basis of which this Parliament, of course partly called for by the Labour Party, agreed that we were bound by such a formula. But this, of course, this sum, in terms of what we will have at our disposal, is in part due to the decisions that we've taken on public sector pay, which the SFC forecast will boost income tax revenues by £62 million in total. Now, should local government decide to follow a lead on pay, and they certainly have the resources at their disposal to do so, it will boost this further. A recent YouGov poll shows public support for our proportionate approach, with more than half of Scots supporting our income tax proposals. As a result of UK government austerity, between 2010-11 and 2019-20, the Scottish Real Terms Discretionary Block Grant will be cut by £2.6 billion. With £500 million of cuts in the next two years alone, this is the time, this is not the time, uh, when, we should further tax those, when we should further tax those at the lowest end of the income tax uh, spectrum. And I see how the Tories sneer when you mention those at the lowest end of the earnings table. I am proposing that we protect the lowest earning taxpayers, introducing a more progressive tax system, contributing to greater tax fairness in Scotland, whilst raising additional revenue to support vital public services and invest <coughs> in the economy. And I believe that these actions, alongside the spending plans for 2018-19, will make Scotland a more attractive place to live and work with access to many services not available elsewhere in the UK. Living in Scotland ensures access to an NHS that is well funded, gives fairness and families access to increasing amounts of free childcare, and means that students pay no education tuition fees, that there is no prescription tax on ill health, and that our older generation can benefit from free personal care. And in an international context, Scotland's overall tax as a proportion of GDP was below the OECD average in 2016. Again, reinforcing that Scotland is not a highly taxed economy. But the steps we are taking today will ensure that it is a fairly taxed country. And to that end, I move the motion in my name. I call on Murdo Fraser to open for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, it feels like we have been debating the Scottish Government's budget for months now. Indeed, we have a reprise of this debate coming up tomorrow uh, with a Stage 3 budget debate. Hooray, say the voices behind me. We're all looking forward to that. So it might seem at this stage in the process that there is little new to add. But nevertheless, I think there is no harm reminding the Chamber exactly what this rates resolution will do today if it is passed by this Parliament. Because it will break a promise made by the SNP in their manifesto in 2016 not to increase the basic rate of income tax, a promise repeated over and over again by the First Minister and many other SNP figures. Because, uh, yes, of course, I'm sure Mr Mason will associate himself with that manifesto commitment. John Mason. I do associate myself with the manifesto commitment, and I thank him for giving way, but would he accept that a manifesto can only be uh, fully uh, brought in 
if there's a majority government and we have a minority government and it cannot bring in all of this manifesto commitment. Well, well uh, Mr. Mr. Mason, Mr. Mason, the Conservatives stood ready to vote with a government prepared to meet their manifesto commitment to keep taxes low. And Mr. Mackay spurned my advances to join in a taxpayers' alliance to protect the people of Scotland from these high taxes. But no, Nicola Sturgeon was quite clear on numerous occasions, and she said, and I quote directly, it was not right to increase income tax for those who are on the basic rate. This is a promise made 53 times in 2016 and 2017, not just by Nicola Sturgeon, but by a whole range of SNP figures. And we haven't heard from Mr Mackay or from Mr Mason an apology, but perhaps one, one SNP speaker in this debate will have the courage to apologise for breaking their manifesto commitment. Because if the Parliament today passes that rate resolution, that promise will be broken. Some 45% of Scottish taxpayers, over 1 million people, will be paying more tax than if they lived south of the border, making Scotland the highest tax part of the United Kingdom. And the overall burden of income tax in Scotland will be higher in Scotland, not, not at the moment, Mr McKee, in other parts of the UK. Now, the SNP seem to want to portray their tax increases as affecting only the rich. This is the message we just got from Mr Mackay. They claim that anyone earning more than £33,000 will be paying uh, more tax as a result of these changes. Anyone earning less than 33000 will be paying less. But what they don't say is that figure is where it is because of the actions of a UK Conservative government increasing the personal allowance that every taxpayer in Scotland benefits from. It is the actions of a UK Conservative government since 2010 effectively doubling the personal allowance that has lifted millions of the lowest paid out of tax altogether and reduced the tax burden uh, from countless others. Uh, yes, I'll give way to Mr Harvey. Patrick Harvey. To Mr Fraser for giving way. Will he finally drop this pretense that increasing the personal allowance is a progressive move? It's been demonstrated time and time again that the bulk of the reduction in revenue that's foregone by government as a result of those measures goes to higher than average income households and the lowest earners gain nothing at all because their incomes are already below the personal allowance threshold. Murder Fraser. He is simply wrong on that. The millions who have benefited from seeing their incomes taken out of tax altogether will disagree with them because people who are the lowest paid, not, not, not the absolute lowest paid, but people in that, in that bracket between earning between £6,000 and £12,000 have been left out of tax altogether thanks to a UK Conservative government. And it's worth remembering too that when those on the SNP benches claim that the lowest earners as a result of their plans will get a reduction in their tax bills, the maximum reduction coming in in April will be some £20. Not £20 a week, not £20 a month, £20 a year. And at the same time, thanks to the actions of a UK Conservative government increasing the personal allowance in April, the self-same beneficiaries of that reduction will get a £70 reduction in their income tax bills. So the changes in April will mean that a UK government, a UK Conservative government, is being three and a half times more generous to the lowest paid than this SNP government is. And we are doing it at a UK level without penalising those earning a bit more as the SNP are doing. Presiding officer, what the, the measure uh, being proposed by the SNP today means is that everyone earning over £26,000 a year will pay more tax in Scotland, not just now, than if they live south of the border. A nurse earning £30,000 a year will pay £40 more. A primary school teacher, a social worker or a paramedic earning £35,000 will pay £90 more. A police officer or a secondary school teacher earning £40,000 will pay £140 more. And a GP earning £70,000 will pay over £1,000 uh, over more. Some 45% of taxpayers, that is a million people, more than a million people, will be paying more than their equivalent south of the border. And these, despite what the Cabinet Secretary says, these are not rich people. These are not the rich. They are hard-working individuals who should be allowed to keep more of what they earn. Yes, I'll give way. Cabinet Secretary. Is Murdo Fraser and the Tory party therefore support the pay rise for the workers that he's just mentioned as proposed by this government? Murdo Fraser. You know, sir, I, think, I think local government workers would like to know if they're getting a pay rise too, because yes. there's nothing 
in the Scottish Government's budget for local government that's going to deliver that, as no doubt we'll hear more about tomorrow. I'm presiding officer, in many cases, these individuals I'm talking about might be the only income earner in their families, because a household income of only £26,000, covering one or two adults and the number of children, is hardly a generous sum. So we need to stop hearing more about how only the rich will pay more under I, these plans. I think it's hard-working, ordinary families who we are talking about, and those who can ill afford to pay substantial sums. And then, presiding officer, is the question of the uh, unintended consequences of these tax changes. So the Cabinet Secretary mentioned the married couples allowance, only available previously uh, at, at the basic rate, worth £200 a year, a significant sum to many people, particularly uh, retired couples or those on low incomes, a measure brought in by a UK Conservative government, I would remind Mr Mackay. Now, I am pleased, I am pleased that thanks to the cooperation and the reasonableness and the generosity of UK Conservative Treasury Ministers, a solution has been found to this particular problem, that people in Scotland will be able to retain the married couple's allowance. Once again, presiding officer, it's the Conservatives having to clean up the mess that the SNP have created in the tax system. So I'm pleased that that has now been resolved and we can reassure all the people who've been writing to us that they're able to keep their married couple's allowance. But there are other issues where we have unintended consequences. Issues such as gift aid. How will gift aid continue to apply in relation to donations to charity in Scotland? How will that be affected? How, for example, will the tax on pension drawdowns be affected? What homework has the Cabinet Secretary done? What engagement and relationship has he had with UK Treasury Ministers? I'm happy to give way if he wants to explain more. Cabinet Secretary. As Murdo Fraser knows fine well, as we've debated this at committee, these were matters all raised by the Scottish Government in the early days of the proposed changes to income tax policy. These issues are in the gift of the UK Government, but they have written to me, which I've now been able to share with the Finance uh, Committee, the resolutions to them. But I've had to wait for the UK Government to respond rather than um, give me early solutions. They have now positively responded, I'm sure, Murdo Fraser, and the whole chamber will welcome uh, that outcome. I'm sure that outcome will give great reassurance to the many people who are concerned about these issues, not least the many charities in Scotland who rely upon that gift aid income. It wouldn't be better if before he announced these changes, the Cabinet Secretary actually sought some agreement with the UK Treasury in advance. If he actually wait when he announced them, he could give that reassurance to people at that particular time. Presiding officer, apart from these questions of process, what worries us from these tax rises is the impact on Scotland's economy. Just last week, the Scottish Retail Consortium warned about the uh, likely impact uh, on economic growth of these tax rises. The Scottish Retail Sales Monitor for January showed that Scottish sales fell by 0.7% on a like-for-like -like basis compared with January 2017. And at that time, the SRC expressed their concern about income tax and council tax rises and the consequences for consumer spending. And these were concerns backed by the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, who said, and I quote, we have warned repeatedly about the threat of Scotland being perceived as a relatively high tax economy and how that impacts on business investment and consumer behaviour. We will be watching shoppers' behaviour closely in the months ahead for signs of restricted consumer spending and tightening disposable income. Presiding officer, these messages are stark. The Cabinet Secretary tries to dismiss those raising these concerns about the impact of higher taxes, but this is what every business organisation in Scotland is telling us. Inflation is going up, food and fuel prices are rising, council taxes are expected to go up across Scotland by 3% in April. Wages are not increasing fast, and on top of that we have this additional income tax burden being imposed by the Scottish Government on 45% of Scottish taxpayers, a clear breach of the promise they made in their manifesto in 2016. Our view, presiding officer, is that the Scottish Government needs to start listening to all these voices expressing concern. Every economic forecast as the Scottish economy growing at a fraction of even the UK average in coming years. That was the stark message of the Fiscal Commission's projections published at the time of the budget and is one being repeated by other economic forecasters. What we know is that if the Scottish economy grew at even the UK average for the period from 2007 to 2022, over that 15-year period, that would be worth an additional £16.5 billion in cash terms to the Scottish economy. That's £16.5 billion lost, the price of our failure to match the performance of the UK economy as a whole. And just think what the faster growing economy could do in terms of expanding our tax base and providing more cash for our public services. 
It would avoid the need for the tax rises we are talking about today. And yet, rather than focus on initiatives to grow the economy, the SNP are determined to increase the tax burden and send out a message that Scotland is the highest tax part of the United Kingdom. Presiding officer, today's increase in income tax in this rate resolution penalises hard-working families. It breaks a promise made by the SNP in 2016 and repeated more than 50 times since. And in making Scotland the highest tax part of the United Kingdom, it will condemn us to years of sluggish economic growth and deprive us of much needed tax revenue as a result. For all these reasons, presiding officer, Parliament should reject the rate resolution before us. Thank you. I call on James Kelly to open for the Labour Party. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. The new tax powers were a chance to present a bold and radical budget. The SNP tax plans fail, fall massively short of what is required, and it's the people of Scotland uh, who will suffer. With a quarter of a million children living in poverty, performance in education on the slide as the economy continues to falter, and an NHS crisis where people struggle to get GP appointments. These tax proposals should be rejected because the SNP have failed to make the changes that will make a difference to people's lives. The fundamental issues with, with the SNP's tax proposal are that it fails on uh, two points in terms of the, both the money raised and also the process that has been followed. When you look at the scale of, and Mr Mackay speaks about this frequently, about the challenges faced by Tory austerity, the, the amount of money raised by the SNP tax plans falls way short. The Fraser of Allender Institute shows that even taking into account the stage one uh, amendments that were made, there's only £83 million available uh, in additional funding uh, once business rate deductions uh, have been taken into account. And that's all that's available. That's not progressive taxation. That is a massive shortfall. And that comes against a, back, a, a backdrop of the SNP uh, voting seven budgets in a row to penalise local government, resulting in cumulative cuts of £1.5 billion. And it's not just the figures, it's the impact that that's had on local communities. Jobs lost, libraries closed, community projects closed down, all as a result of SNP budget decisions. And the rate uh, resolution that we have before us this afternoon does not address the scale of the problems faced in Scotland's communities. I think there's also uh, some flaws in the process that uh, Mr Mackay has followed. He's made great play of, you know, the behavioural aspects of taxation. When Mr Mackay submitted his tax proposals to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, they were downgraded um, by £56 million, uh, something that was accepted by Mr Mackay. We've not heard anything um, from Mr Mackay or the government in terms of what went on at the challenge meetings, uh, which are part of this process, and what representations he made in order to try and save this uh, £56, £56 million to be included uh, in the budget. The reality is... Yes, sure. Cabinet Secretary. Can I just be clear here, is James Kelly suggesting that I as a minister should interfere with the Scottish Fiscal Commission actual forecast just because I have a different opinion? Are you suggesting I interfered with the evidence that they've given to me? James Kelly. I'm saying very clearly to Mr Mackay, there is, uh, there's an onus on you in legislation. If you disagree with that forecast, then you can produce your own forecast and you can provide a written explanation uh, to this parliament. And what, what in effect happened in this process was you put in your proposals, they told you that there were £56 million less and you wrote the figure down and said thank you very much and then included that in the budget. And that then ferment we had £56 million less to spend on the NHS to invest in public services and to properly support the funding of public sector pay. You could have looked uh, at alternative models and you could have looked at alternative forecasts. This has been looked seriously by some of the Parliament's committees 
And we've seen international examples where there are variances in taxes in US states. And the Finance Committee looked closely at what happened in Switzerland where the, there are different tax rates and the behavioural aspects the Finance Committee noted uh, were minimal. So you had an opportunity to challenge that, to come up with your own forecast. And we don't know anything about the process. You might have challenged it, but the reality is the budget is £56 million less because you accepted that forecast. And there were alternative methodologies that certainly could, uh, could have been used and examined. In terms of the, the, the Labour plan, our proposal, we, we, we think that the, uh, what the government have, uh, have come forward with is, falls far too short. And we have proposed, proposed a £960 million plan uh, to, invest, to invest in the Scottish budget. Because that's what's, that, that's what's required. If you look at the level, of the level of the cuts that local councils are, are facing, even taking into account the settlement announced at stage one, there's still a £368 million pounds shortfall. Look at... Sure. Bruce Crawford. Let me first some, do something unusual first. Let me congratulate the Labour Party. At least the Labour Party brought forward proposals for this Parliament to discuss, discuss, unlike the Tory Party, who just want to cut the budget by £500 million. Pounds. But the devil is always in the detail. In that £960 million, pounds, how much will you raise in next financial year from your tourism tax? James Kelly. The, the government had the onus to bring forward, in terms of the tourism tax, the, the, the government can have brought forward emergency legislation which would have, which would have invested £70 Absolutely. million pounds 70 million. in next year's budget. And I'll tell, you what the, I'll tell you what the difference between our approach and the government's approach what we've heard from Mr Mackay is a litany uh, of excuses as to why, why he can't raise tax, why he can't produce uh, a substantial investment plan that addresses the issues that are, the, the, that are at the heart of Scotland's communities. The reality is he didn't have the political will to bring these plans forward. I mean, the, the plans tinkered round the edges they were making. I don't think it's right the MSPs uh, should only be paying 29 pence more a week in tax. Surely we can do much more than, more than that uh, as a parliament. And I think what has happened in effect is that if you look at the SNP after 10 years, their, their approach to this tax rate debate sums them up. There's a complacent attitude uh, at the heart of government. You don't have to go too far from this parliament to find people sleeping rough on the streets, to find children who've got holes in their shoes and families can't buy them proper clothing to go to school. And we've seen in the last 24 hours the, the, the level of drug deaths in Scotland at the highest in the EU. These are all issues that would be of real concern to, to the parliament. These are real challenges, but when you raise them, it strikes me that what the SNP do is they they shrug their shoulders and say, oh, we're doing our best, you know, don't criticise us. But let me tell you, that's simply not good enough. You know, we've had too many excuses. What we needed was a much more ambitious ta tax plan. We needed a budget rooted in fairness, but also designed to invest in public services and support economic growth. We needed a budget that was going to meet the big challenges that was going to produce an alternative that deliver for Scotland's communities. And in that regard, the SNP rate resolution and the SNP budget falls way short and we should reject it at five o'clock. Thank you, Colin. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Willie Reddy. Patrick Harvey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak in a debate on a decision which will give effect to the radical opportunity that we have to build a fairer tax system for Scotland. Derek Mackay opened the debate saying that he wanted to put progressive values into practice. Well, what that means has to be raising more revenue for the vital public services in every community of Scotland that we all depend on, while protecting low earners and reducing inequality. 
That's what it means to have progressive values in the use of income tax powers. And those were the principles on which the Scottish Greens nearly two years ago published our proposals, fair funding for public services in the run-up to the Holyrood election. And at that point, we were the only political party actually putting forward a credible, costed, well-worked-out plan that could achieve that, that could raise revenue, reduce inequality, and protect low earners at the same time. It's worth recalling just briefly what the SNP's reaction was to those proposals, but also why their reaction was what it was. They did completely reject the idea of more rates and bans to make a fairer system, as we were proposing. And during those election debates, Nicola Sturgeon repeatedly challenged the Labour Party on their proposal simply to increase the basic rate as a whole. Her reason for doing that was that that approach would hit people on lower than average incomes. Now, that was true. That was a fair argument to use against a blanket increase in the basic rate of income tax. But what the SNP had no answer for at that time was our proposal for more rates and bans to ensure that you can raise revenue while protecting those low earners. Doing both, raising the revenue and what Nicola Sturgeon said she wanted to do is protecting low earners. So I hugely welcome, I hugely welcome the progress that the SNP have made to date, as well as the progress that the Labour Party have made uh, in, a, in dropping their proposal for a blanket increase in the basic rate and proposing ideas that we've been talking about for years, like a derelict land levy. It's not a land value tax, it's a derelict land levy and a visitor levy. Things that we have been advocating but which would take the time to legislate for and I hope that we'll have the opportunity to continue to work together on that. I give way to Mr Fraser who's Mr. asked Fraser. I, I'm very grateful to Mr Harvey for giving way. I wonder if he would reflect on the fact that in the Scottish Parliament election in 2016, 65% of the voters endorsed parties, the SNP and ourselves, who were opposed to any increase in the basic rate of taxation. What level of support did his tax plans have at that time? Patrick Harvey. Our tax plans, I am very pleased to say, have shifted the debate across the political landscape in Scotland far more than his plan to simply copy, to simply copy the tax cuts for high earners only that his party remains committed to at UK level. There's a further criticism that I continue to make uh, of the SNP. Because the use of rhetoric around being the lowest tax part of the UK, I'm afraid, falls into a trap that is being set. It fails to commit to this direction of travel. It's a, it's a little bit like that simplistic rhetoric around uh, continually increasing the personal allowance. When you, you add £500 to the personal allowance, you do take a tiny sliver of the workforce out of the income tax system altogether, and they save the small amount of income tax they would have been paying. But so do high earners. High earners get that benefit from increasing the personal allowance as well. So it is not a progressive approach. This country should not be competing for, with our neighbours as a low tax environment because we know the consequences of tax competition. Those consequences are austerity, inequality, ever-growing tax avoidance and the real human consequences like the return of food poverty on a scale that I think most people in this country thought would never happen again. And so I put to the Scottish Government, they should not be using this rhetoric to compete with our neighbours and certainly not to compete with the current Conservative UK Government uh, on the notion of tax competition. Fair, progressive use of taxation is a prerequisite for a civilised society. Is this package being put forward today perfect? No. I've been very clear that we put forward further tax proposals to the Scottish Government, fully worked out and in plenty of time to ensure that they had the opportunity to scrutinise them. And I wish that others had done the same uh, as well. If other opposition parties had engaged in that sense, I think there'd have been even greater potential to push the Scottish Government beyond its comfort zone. But the reality of a period like this, presiding officer, of a, a period of minority government is clear. It is inevitable that political parties will disagree. But if we all dig in our heels and demand perfection or nothing, then nothing is what we will achieve. 
what today's rate resolution achieves, and I'm very pleased that the Greens have played a pivotal role in bringing us to this point, is a huge step, a bold reform toward progressive use of income tax powers, reducing inequality and funding our public services. I'll be happy to support it tonight. Thank you very much, Mr Harvey. I call Willie Rennie to be followed by Ivan McKee. Mr Rennie, please. Yeah, thank you, Deputy President Officer. Um, these substantial new powers that have been delivered by and driven forward by the coalition government change the nature of the debate in the parliament today. We must now be conscious of the impact of money in people's pockets as well as the money in the public sector as well and the funding of our public services. And it is a delicate balance. I think we need to work really hard to make sure that balance is right. And so we need, I think, a frank and open debate about those powers to make sure that we're getting that balance right. And that debate needs to happen before elections as well as after elections. Now, Liberal Democrats were frank at the last election. We said to the voters that we would raise income tax by a penny to raise £500 million for education. And our assessment was that because Scottish education had gone from one of the best in the world to just average, we needed to make that investment. We needed to ask everyone to pay a little bit more in order to have that transformational effect on our education system. So we were very clear about our priorities. We were honest with people about what we would expect them to pay. That was our approach in the election. And it's one that we regret that the SNP did not take because Nicola Sturgeon stood on platforms, same as me, during that election campaign, and she promised that there would be no increase in the basic rate of income tax. And I have viewed that with astonishment at the time because here was a self-professed left-wing government at the height of its authority, with as everybody expected it to win the election, that there was very real strains on public services, but it sat and did nothing. Never brought forward any radical proposals to amend the complaints that they had about the money that they were receiving from Westminster. So no longer could they claim that it was all Westminster's fault when a major financial lever remained untouched. But the rhetoric was exposed at that time for all to see. And now we've got an SNP government that will increase the very tax that they said they would not at the election time. So the question now is about their integrity more than anything else. Can they be frank with the voters about what they're proposing? And I know Derek Mackay's got his answers about being the lowest tax part of the country for a certain number of taxpayers, but the reality was that he said during the election, he said during the election that the basic rate taxpayers would not see an increase, and they're now seeing an increase. So there's a lack of frankness uh, from the SNP, something that perhaps, no, not just now, so I think it's really important that the SNP reflect on their behaviour before the last election and now understand why people are frustrated with their lack of honesty at this very time. The tax that they propose today, however, is not something that I can support. It does not deliver that transformational investment in education that we believe that we need to make. And without that transformational investment in education, we cannot support the SNP's proposals. Now, we believe that it's important to get that balance right between asking people to pay a bit more and the investment that we get. I think it's really important to be specific about how you're going to spend the money so people can see the results from their investment because you've got to have confidence in the tax system and how it operates in order for people to accept the decisions that are made by this parliament. So we're not a party of automatically high tax or low tax. You have to make the judgment at the time that is right for the investment in public services and balancing up what is needed by the private citizens and the money that they need to make ends meet from day to day. And I don't think this budget matches the requirements and the aspirations. But the Conservatives need to be careful as well because they claim to be a party um, of the economy, but yet they are the party that is overseeing a drive towards a hard Brexit that will damage our economy. So they need to be very, very careful when they criticise anyone else for economic irresponsibility. But they also need to understand and they need to reflect that they are a party that is advancing, advancing tax rises in England. 
We've seen a tax rise proposed for care. We've seen a tax rise proposed for the police in England. We've seen councils in Scotland run by the Conservatives that are proposing tax rises. The Conservatives are against tax rises for the better off. They're just in favour of tax rises for everyone else. And that's why they need to be honest as well about what their approach to taxation is as well. So today's debate, I think, is a great disappointment to us that we're not able to make that investment in education that we desperately need for this country. The Scottish education system used to be the pride, I would say, of the world. People used to look to us for what we were able to do with our young people. And unless we start investing properly in nursery education, in schools and in colleges, we will see a continual decline in the performance of our education system. And that will have a dramatic long-term effect on our economy. I've got a shh. Can I take an intervention? I'll take an intervention. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, just to ask, will there any in the use of the term us, is that an us of five or an us of three? Liberal Democrats are, Willie Rennie. The, the Liberal Democrats, as the Minister knows, are very, very clear about what we view this budget as. Our MSPs have been very specific in the Northern Isles that they were prepared to stand up for their constituency under the threat of an SNP government that wasn't going to deliver on their promises for the Northern Isles ferries. And we were not prepared to go along with that. That is why, that is why the Liberal Democrats will oppose the tax resolution that is proposed by the SNP today because it does not meet the ambition that we have set forward for this country. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ivan McKee to be followed by Bill Bowman. Mr McKee, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, this debate today is about tax, but it's also about credibility. The stark contrast between a Scottish Government that takes responsibility for putting together a budget that serves the people of Scotland and a Tory opposition that not only focuses only on the top 15% of earners, but worse than that, a Tory opposition that can't even get its numbers to add up. So let's start by reminding ourselves of the facts. The majority of taxpayers and the vast majority of basic rate taxpayers are better off under this Scottish Government's budget. 70% of Scottish taxpayers will see their tax bill reduced next year. Most Scots pay less income tax under this Government's proposals than they would if they live in the rest of the UK or under the proposals from the Tory opposition. And that is only part of the story because individuals and families don't just look at their income tax in isolation, they look at their total tax position. And with council tax increases capped at 3% in Scotland, but the rest of the UK seen increases of up to 6%, the average council taxpayer in Scotland is now almost £500 better off than they would be if they were down south. That's real money for real families, and it counts. And what also counts is the higher level of services that the people of Scotland benefit from. No tuition fees, no prescription charges, and the best performing health service in the whole of the UK. So let's be clear, Scotland is the lowest tax part of the UK and it's the fairest tax part of the UK. And this is a budget that delivers for business. Business organisations demanded shifting increases in business rates from RPI to CPI. This delivered by the Scottish Government. Continuing with the small business bonus, meaning that more than 100,000 Scottish small businesses pay no rates at all. In total, business rates mitigation in Scotland of 660 million real help to real businesses delivered by this Scottish Government. £270 million pound more for economic development portfolio to allow the Scottish Government to continue to support ambitious businesses to grow and to export and to intervene, as we have seen in so many cases, to save threatened businesses so they can survive and thrive. £600 million pound for the rollout of super fast broadband to 100% of homes and businesses in Scotland by 2021, putting the tiny sums invested by the UK Government in this programme into embarrassing perspective. The Scottish Government doing the heavy lifting to bring Scotland's internet infrastructure up to world-class levels, despite broadband rollout being a reserved responsibility. Westminster not at the table. And with an eye on the future of manufacturing industry in this country, key to our export growth agenda, investing and establishing the National Manufacturing Institute, welcomed by business organisations across Scotland. And on income tax itself, the Scottish Council for Development and Industry is clear. This is a progressive and mature use of Scotland's income tax powers, they say. 
Because this is a budget focused on economic growth, and it's a budget that's economically literate with numbers that actually add up. Meanwhile, from the Tories, all we hear is jam tomorrow. Extra demands for public spending that Tory members stand in this chamber and demand every day of the week. Now the more than 100 demands for more public money. Uncosted and just as well because they have no idea how to pay for it. And that even before the question is asked how the Tories' alternative reality budget would pay for public sector pay increases, all the investments I've outlined that business organisations are crying out for. And that before they explain how they would fund tax cuts for the better off or how they would fund the £200 million cuts in Scotland's revenue spend budget next year as a consequence of cuts by their colleagues at Westminster. So, uh, indeed I shall. Mr Fraser didn't give way to me twice, but I shall give way to him. Murdo Fraser. I, 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 I'm sorry, Mr McKay, I took four interventions, I think, in the course of my opening remarks, and there's only so much joy you can have in the course of a short debate. Um, <laughs> the point I was going to make to Mr McKee was simply this. When SNP members in the past and more recently have called for cuts in corporation tax, cuts in air departure tax, cuts in VAT on tourism, cuts in VAT on building repairs, did they spell out how those cuts would be paid for? Ivan McKee. Oh, yeah, yeah. As Mr Fraser is well aware, corporation tax was a proposal for after independence, and clearly after independence, when we have full control of all the levers, then it's a very, very different position. At the moment, we don't even have corporation tax. So if Mr Fraser would be happy to join with us in asking for corporation tax to be devolved, then we could have a discussion about what that corporation tax level should be. So where is all this extra money supposed to come from the Tories are asking for? When pressed on this, we heard today about the vast sums that will be saved from not rolling out the baby box, less than £8 million to fund spending and tax changes worth more than 100 times that. New calculator needed on the Tory benches, I think. When pressed further, delayed discharge in NHS agency staff are mentioned. Despite delayed discharge down 10% in Scotland compared to a year ago, and both of those spend items in Scotland below what they are in Tory-controlled English Health Service. If that was the source of the magic money tree, then why hasn't it been done where the Tories are already in control? And even if none of that were true, sure. James Kelly. I, I thank Mr McKee for uh, giving way. Uh, Mr McKee represents Glasgow Province, where some of the wards run very, very high levels of child poverty, which would be a concern to all of us, including Mr McKee. What, did he, what does he think the budget has done to address those child poverty levels? Ivan McKee. As Mr Kelly is well aware, we've taken steps to reduce the tax that the lowest income earners are paying in Scotland. We've also taken steps to remove the pay cap so that public sector workers are getting paid pay increases that they deserve. But what we're not doing is making up monopoly money like Mr Kelly and his party are to fund things that don't exist. That's the difference between us and them. We're credible, we can deliver. They just talk about monopoly money and talk about ignoring the economic reality as expressed by the SFC. So... And even if none of that were true, the Tory party's plans would still not stack up or none of that extra money would be available to fund their tax or spend plans in the coming year. Presiding officer, the reality is that this is indeed economic illiteracy from the Scottish Tories. It does their credibility no good. And if they want to be treated as a credible opposition in this place, they have to do better. In conclusion, presiding officer, this government's tax plans are credible, they're costed, and they serve well the people and the economy of Scotland. And that's why this parliament should, should support this Scottish government's tax plans. Thank you very much, Ms McKee. Uh, before I call Bill Bowman, remind members there is, time for, there is time for interventions. I call Bill Bowman to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Mr Bowman, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And just to reassure Mr McKee, I don't think I mentioned jam once in my speech. I've had a quick look. Today, the SNP seek this Parliament's approval of their plan to increase taxes on Scottish workers. In effect, they seek approval for something else also, their decision to break the manifesto promise to the people of Scotland not to increase taxes. That was the assurance the SNP gave Scots when they wanted their votes. Nicola Sturgeon boldly announced that she had been very clear that the government will not increase income tax. We support that approach and almost two-thirds of Scots voted for parties who promised not to raise taxes. During this debate last year, Derek Mackay stood in this chamber and proudly declared that he was determined to stay true to the SNP's income tax proposals. One year on, the only thing Mr Mackay has stayed true to is his willingness to use the ever-eager Greens to push through his budget. So eager, in fact, that Mr Harvey seems to have forgotten to actually require any of his own his party's own income tax policies to be adopted. 
With a straight face, Mr Mackay presented the deal as a tough negotiation going down to the wire. Later. Given the ideological gulf between the two parties, we can imagine negotiations only having dragged on literally for minutes. But there, there is a serious point to be made. Mr Mackay has chosen to increase taxes for almost half of all taxpayers. More than half a million Scottish workers earning over £26,000, nurses, teachers, social workers, police officers, paramedics, and many more ordinary hard-working people. Is this the SNP's idea of the wealthiest in society? They are saying that they are helping the lowest paid. With no sign of embarrassment, Mr Mackay announced a tax cut of up to £20 a year for some. I invite Mr Mackay to visit Dundee's more deprived areas to explain to the hard-pressed families how his tax cut, which wouldn't cover the cost of his return train fare, will help them out of poverty. Families across Scotland need real help, not gesture politics. Since 2010, the Conservative UK government has cut taxes for Scots on the basic rate by over £1,000. And at the weekend, we saw how the Chancellor will step in to save married Scots from losing their tax allowance, which was put at real threat thanks to this SNP budget. That is the sort of action that genuinely helps people, and the SNP would be wise to follow the Conservative example. These ill-conceived and unnecessary tax rises will affect the wider economy too, which is already suffering after a decade of SNP mismanagement and incompetence. We have sluggish growth, just a third of the overall OECD rate. We have the highest business rates in Europe, whilst confidence is amongst the lowest in Europe. Pro well, yes. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. Would he accept that Westminster might have a little bit of influence on the Scottish economy? Uh, where are we? Mr Bowman. Are we growing at the less than half the UK rate then? Problems, to come back to my speech, problems at firms across my own area of Dundee and the wider North East only know too well thanks to the <coughs> SNP. And our productivity sees painfully <coughs> slow increases. So despite this shambolic record, Mr Mackay, ably assisted by Mr Harvey, is about to pour petrol on the fire with yet another round of tax hikes. Now, it would be easy for me to stand here and reel off a list of respected bodies who have warned against the SNP's damaging tax plans. So I shall. The Federation of Small Businesses, the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, Scottish Engineering, the Scottish Retail Consortium, and CBI Scotland, all warning about the negative impact of tax increases. Former CBI Scotland Director Ian McMillan sums it up with a simple message. Widening the tax gap with the rest of the UK is likely to cause great damage to the Scottish economy. The worst part of all this, though, is that it is being done willingly, inflicting economic hardship on Scottish workers and risking the Scottish economy as a political choice taken by Derek Mackay and Patrick Harvey. We know the Scottish budget is going up thanks to the UK government. Mr Mackay has said so himself. Yet he persists with a budget that takes from hard-working Scots, cuts council budgets to the bone and ignores the advice of Scotland's leading economic bodies. Whilst the SNP and the Greens might be content to view hard-working Scots as a cash cow, on these benches we stand up for hard-pressed families, we stand up for businesses, we stand up for people getting on and aspiring to do better in life. Patrick Harvey. I'm, I'm grateful. Perhaps uh, the, the member, unlike any of his colleagues so far, will say where in the Scottish budget the extra £500 million will come from to fulfil the Conservative tax policies. We're debating a, an income tax rate resolution here. If he wants to, ta to cut taxes for the wealthy, as his colleagues in the UK are, are doing, where will that come from within the Scottish budget? Bill Bowman. I think you perhaps weren't listening to uh, Murdo Fraser. In, in his speech, where I think said that. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure he will happily send you a video clip to watch again and perhaps take more care, and you're listening. The SNP have already lost the trust of Scottish business now. Thanks to their broken promise on tax, they're about to lose the trust of the Scottish people as well. 
Last year, Mr Mackay was steadfast that suggestions to increase rates or changes in bans were an experiment with every tax lever in an almost careless and reckless fashion. Those extreme positions do not serve the Scottish taxpayer well, he maintained. Yet this is what he now proposes. In Mr Mackay's own words, this budget is a careless and reckless experiment at the expense of the Scottish people. And for once, I agree with Mr Mackay's economic assessment. Thank you. Thank you. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Elaine Smith. Mr McMillan, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Presiding officer, in his earlier contribution, Murdo Fraser spoke of the generosity of his UK Tory uh, government colleagues. And Will Bowman, just a few moments ago, spoke about the economic hardship. However, I suggest to both Murdo Fraser and to Bill Bowman, that I suggest that they actually talk to the people who used some of the 76,764 packages of emergency food taken between April and September of last year. Now that figure is expected to more than, to more than over 150,000 food packages for this year. Here is the generosity of the public, not a Tory government, slashing welfare payments, managing a cruel system, uh, <clears throat> actually forcing some people back into work, people who actually can't go back into work. So I'm sorry, Mr Fraser and Mr Bowman, uh, your party down in London is certainly having an adverse effect upon tens of thousands of people, not just in Scotland, but across the rest of the UK. So when it comes to talking about £500 million pounds worth of, uh, of, of, of some tax policies to actually aid the richest and the wealthiest, as compared to the poorest and those who actually require that money, then I think it's, your, it's, the, it's the Conservative Party that needs to apologise to the population of Scotland to, to act, and also beg for their forgiveness. If, if you're going to actually beg for forgiveness, I'll take your intervention. <laughs> I, suspect, I suspect Mr McMillan no. Well, you can Mr. try, Fraser. you can try. a year. Do you really think that? Stuart McMillan. What, what I believe, Mr Fraser, is that the population of Scotland, the majority of the population of Scotland, actually want to have a fairer and more, and more progressive system to, so, to, ensure, to ensure that those who are less well off can actually have a better quality and standard of living. And I, I'm sure, Mr Fraser, if he wants to come to Inverclyde and actually talk to many of my constituents, they will tell them exactly that they actually want to have that type of system. Now, it has been said many times, but it is worth reiterating that the setting of this budget is taking place against the backdrop of that tough economic and public expenditure of conditions due to Mr Fraser's Conservative colleagues down in Westminster. And it's also important to remember that the, the Scottish Government didn't take the decision to alter income tax rates in Scotland lightly. However, the following the publication and the findings of the discussion paper examining the role of income tax in Scotland, this is clearly the right decision to ensure that we protect our public services and also grow our economy. Now let's assess the Tory cuts to Scotland that the people seem to be keen to, uh, that Tories certainly seem to be keen to forget. Between 2010-11 and 2019-20, Scotland's discretionary budget allocation has, de has decreased by 8%. That's £2.6 billion in real terms. And for 2018-19 alone, the fiscal resource budget allocation is to be £221 million lower in real terms than the previous financial year. And over the next two years, a block grant from the UK government for day-to-day -day spending is projected to fall by £500 million. Yet, Mr Fraser and Ruth Davidson's party seem to think that Scotland has more than enough funds to actually increase public spending, but keep tax rates at the same or even decrease them for some. Now, also, the Tories are dragging Scotland out of the EU, which will have a hugely negative impact on Scotland's productivity, our trade and our migration, thought to mean a loss of around £12.7 billion a year for the Scottish economy. And this flies in the face of the recent report that named Scotland as the third best largest European region for foreign direct investment. It also highlights in its findings that Brexit remains a clear threat to Scotland's investment potential. Now, today, uh, David Davis, uh, he's apparently trying to reassure uh, people that in his, his comments today saying that uh, the UK will not be plunged into a Mad Max style world borrowed from dystopian fiction emphasises just how clueless the Tories actually are in Brexit and also the result they're actually trying to discredit genuine concerns about how the UK actually will operate once we've actually left the EU. Now the Scottish Government did specify however that the proposals on income tax needed to meet four key tests uh, they must maintain and promote public services in the, in the face of the UK spending cuts. 
protect the incomes of low earners, make income tax more progressive and contribute to tackling inequality, but and also support economic growth. In doing so, the changes to the tax system will, will actually increase revenues for growing Scotland's economy and also transforming our public services. Now, ultimately, though, these tax proposals protect those on the lowest incomes, making the system fairer and also more progressive. And for the majority of taxpayers, Scotland will be the lowest taxed part of the UK, with 55% of Scottish income taxpayers paying less than the people earning the same amount and living elsewhere in the UK in 2018-19 under these new proposals. And more than two-thirds of taxpaying Scots will be paying less income tax next year as a result of these changes too, emphasising this SNP Scottish Government's commitment to actually safeguarding low earners' pay packets. And in Inverclyde, in Inverclyde data based on the annual survey of hours and earnings indicates that almost 80% of Inverclyde residents will be paying less income tax in 2018-19 as compared with the current financial year. I'll say that again, 80 nearly 80% of Inverclyde residents paying less income tax in 2018-19. I, I can take one more. Michelle Valentine. Can I ask then, what do you say to one of your supporters, somebody who voted independence, who has, has been a supporter of the SNP all along, who has written to myself and one of your members to say that he is frustrated beyond belief because he has worked really hard, he grew up in a deprived area, both he and his wife grew up in poverty, they've worked really hard, they now have good jobs, they've been able to buy a nice house in a nice area, they have one child and they are now struggling and they've just heard that you're going to put up their taxes, they've, you've put up their in council tax through your higher rate tax. It is an intervention, banks. please, and uh, they not a now, long speech. They are now struggling because they want to have a second child and now feel they can't afford it. What is your message to them? Well, my message is please make interventions, interventions and not uh, intermediate speeches. Mr McMillan. Thank you, presiding officer. I say to Michelle Ballantyne that the deal that's actually on the table for Scotland is the best deal in the UK. <laughs> And I have many constituents who have contacted me who actually are very much supportive of this. And actually some of them are not SNP voters. So this is the best deal for Scotland and it's the best deal in the UK. Now, Presiding Officer, I'm now conscious of time. No, Mr. no, Jack. you make up your time. I'll okay, you well, up your thank time. you very much. Okay, that's great. Uh, I can see Jackie Bailey's delighted uh, with your comments there. Certainly some in the chamber will say that uh, uh, that certainly, in terms of uh, the aspect of, the, of taxation, some of the chamber will say that that's all well and good, but the top rate of tax must be increased further. But I believe that the Scottish Government's top rate tax, tax pro proposals will generate the most income with the least risk of losing revenues next year and also damaging the economy. And certainly, just on that particular point, my colleague, my colleague Bruce Crawford actually asked James Kelly the question about the, uh, about the tourism tax that he was talking about earlier on. He couldn't answer. So if he doesn't know how much additional money is going to come in for the tourism tax, then what's the situation going to be regarding his top line tax? Now, on that point, I know you are now You are concluding. Thank you. Yeah. So, I thank call Elaine Smith to be followed by John Mason. Ms Smith, please. Thank you, President Officer. So here we are, one year on from Derek Mackay's historic day when the Scottish Parliament was able to use its new tax powers to set all rates and bans for income tax in Scotland. These powers were demanded by the SNP to do things differently in Scotland or to borrow a phrase from our first First Minister, Donald Dewar, to deliver Scottish solutions for Scottish problems. But unlike the timid approach of the SNP, Scottish Labour believes that those new tax powers should be used to their full extent to create a fairer, more prosperous society to redistribute both power and wealth from the haves to the have-nots. If society is to be just, we must all contribute according to our ability and each receive according to our need. But even those on the SNP benches who are sceptical of this socialist approach to taxation would surely agree with what Donald Dewar said about tax powers on the 31st of July 1997 in the House of Commons during the White Paper debate on Scotland's Parliament. He said, it is important to recognise that the power may be used to deal with some special project or difficulty. Scottish Labour have laid out clearly in our budget proposal how the Scottish Government's tax powers could be used to fund the £5 child benefit top-up policy. Certainly. 
John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. Would she accept that there is a risk of some behavioural change and people avoiding tax if the difference between England and Scotland is too great? Elaine thank Smith. you, I thank the member for that intervention because it's, it's something I'm going to cover extensively soon because I actually think that we in this parliament have a duty to lead the way on behavioural change as well, but I'm going to come to that. However, back to my point that I was making, research which the Scottish Government is well aware of yet refuses to act upon shows that topping up child benefit by £5 per week would lift 30,000 children out of poverty. If the Scottish Government used their powers over taxation progressively, then they could comfortably cover the cost of topping up the child benefit estimated at £256 million. Surely, with 260,000 Scottish children living in poverty, the powers of the Scottish Parliament should be used to address this urgently. Briefly, if possible. Cabinet Secretary. Would Elaine Smith not be concerned that the research that I've seen suggests that only £3 out of every 10 would actually reach those children in uh, greatest need? Thank you, President Officer, Smith. and I thank the member, and I also anticipated that, which I will be addressing in just a moment. But if I can finish this point, not only would topping up child benefit mean fewer children would go hungry or cold or suffer social exclusion or be stigmatised for being poor, but in principle this would show that Scotland is prepared to meet its moral obligations. Its ability, it's the ability to tackle issues like child poverty and all the unfair manifestations of it that a child is likely to bear throughout their life that I believe forms a fundamental justification of this very parliament. Now, presiding officer, we've heard it argued from, uh, John Mason actually just recently put the question, but that tax, uh, from the SNP that tax avoidance is a perfectly rational response to tax increases. Of course, that's usually a Tory argument. However, debate around tax and behavioural change is far from settled, and there is growing evidence that when it comes to tax, people often do not act out of self-interest alone. There are ways that behavioural changes, such as tax avoidance, can be offset. Sadly, the Scottish Government seems to assume that tax avoidance is inevitable, and that's an assumption which I think only serves to legitimise this behaviour. However, the British Psychological Society have highlighted research which suggests tax attitudes improve when the link to public expenditure is made. And I would suggest that it's our job in this Parliament to make that connection and to persuade people that taxes are being used wisely to better our society for all of us to benefit. The so-called social contract that the SNP used to believe in. The goal of lifting 30,000 children out of poverty is surely one that can speak to the hearts of the people of Scotland and therefore motivate every single one to pay their fair share. And now I anticipated uh, that the response to this, uh, as hinted actually in a reply to my question in the chamber recently, might be the one that the, the cabinet secretary was coming to there. They might suggest that since child benefit is a universal benefit, it's not one which will capture the hearts of the richest Scottish people. But before I address the reason why child benefit top up is in fact a policy people can get behind, I would like to address something of a hypocrisy in that position. The SNP attack the topping up of a universal benefit, yet they seem to have been long committed to universal policies. We hear SNP speakers trotting out Scottish universal benefits for a claim such as the baby box, the free higher education, free personal care, free school meals for younger children. And as a socialist, I support universality. But its wider acceptability is dependent on an understanding of progressive taxation. If they're better off benefit, then they can, of course, pay back through fair progressive taxation. However, the main point here is the justification of the universal child benefit policy. And I come to the point that Derek Mackay mentioned, that only three pounds in every 10 pounds spent on child benefit top up would go to households in poverty. Well, whilst I believe that this would actually be money well spent on poorer children, it's also vital to keep in mind that our job in this parliament is not just to lift children out of poverty, but to prevent children from being pulled into poverty. An additional £5 per week per child for households on a financial cliff edge at risk of being pulled into poverty would help stop the rising child poverty levels. And given that the IFS forecasts that a further 100,000 children in Scotland will be living in poverty by 2020, we must act now to prevent this shocking forecast becoming a reality. Presiding officer, I believe that most decent-minded people would feel that this is a cause that their taxes could support. So, in conclusion, I did not seek election to this parliament to tinker at the edges, and neither did any of my Scottish Labour comrades. 
We are here to fight against the scandal of Scottish poverty and the inequality that underpins it. We are here carrying on the legacy of James Keir Hardy, who said, and for men, President Officer, read women too, the Democratic Labour Party of the future, composed of men in earnest, men who will go to Parliament not to ape the manners of the classes, but to bring relief to the suffering masses. We are here for the many, not the few, and we will not support these timid tax rates today. Thank you, Ms Smith. I call John Mason to follow by Alison Harris. Mr uh, Mason, please. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. As has been said, we do seem to discuss this topic of Scottish income tax quite a lot, uh, but clearly uh, what Scotland is doing with income tax is extremely important. Uh, and today I would like to state that I think the government approach is the correct one. And we need to challenge some of the myths that we are hearing this afternoon and previously from both the Conservative and Labour. So I'd like to go through some of these myths. Uh, number one myth comes from the Conservatives, which is something like, we can cut taxes but still have more money to spend on services. Uh, well, no, we can't. As a general rule, if we want to protect services, let alone improve them, the money has to come from somewhere. And that means either we cut expenditure somewhere else, we borrow, or we raise taxation. Now, there seems to be a suggestion from the Conservatives that lots of money is being wasted, and that can be used to pay for services. Well, firstly, they should tell us where that wastage is, and presumably they would cut that department's budget. But the reality is that we all waste money from time to time. We buy food which we do not use, or music we do not listen to, or pay for a holiday. Someone is sick, and we cannot uh, use it. That is life and cannot be wholly prevented. So if the Conservatives are trying to tell us that there would be no money wasted under a Conservative government, I think they will find that most people will laugh at them. Of course, there are issues like big IT projects where uh, money uh, has been wasted. And the reality is that most big organisations have had bad experiences with IT, both in the public and in the private sectors. The public sector is more transparent, so we hear more about it. But we know that the private sector has problems with IT as well. I think that is something we just have to live with. The second Conservative myth uh, is around the economy and comes, uh, I would suggest, in three parts. Absolutely, yes. Edward Mountain. Thank you. Uh, on the issue of IT projects, and I'm going to declare an interest that I, I am a partner in a farm. We spend £178 million on a computer that doesn't work, and we're spending more per year on running that computer than it would cost to buy a new computer system. Does the member think that's good value for money? John Mason. My point is that every government, including Conservative governments, and virtually every big business... Uh, and I've, I've seen it uh, where I've had interactions with uh, big companies, have got into problems with IT. And that is just something that is not going to be avoided, whoever is in power. That is the point I am trying to make. The second conservative myth, as I said, is around the economy. That growing the economy is the be-all and end-all. That it does not matter how the benefits of growth are shared out. And that higher taxation inevitably damages economic growth. Well, the problem is that we have seen relatively low taxation, certainly a lot lower than when I was younger but in recent years, but actually growth recently has not been that great. Let's remember, too, that the economy is mainly influenced by Westminster, not by the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government. What growth there has been has not benefited everyone. If we do nothing to intervene, growing the economy is likely to only benefit those at the very top, perhaps the top 10% or the top 1% of people. So the two issues are largely distinct. How do we grow the economy more? And how do we use taxation to, make, to more fairly share the income and the wealth of our society? And it's probably also a good time to point out a related Tory myth that higher taxation will drive away individuals and businesses. No, I do not accept this is the case. Individuals and businesses are looking for a number of things, including an educated workforce, good schools for their kids, health services, roads, and other infrastructure. But these things only come about through taxation. To take an extreme example, if there was no taxation at all and no schools at all, I do not think we would see many individuals or many businesses coming to Scotland. The fourth myth, again from the Conservatives, is that it would be a disaster if Scotland was different from England in any individual way. The whole point of devolution was to allow different parts of the UK to do things differently 
in the way that suited them best. Now, the Conservatives may prefer a more centralist or totalitarian approach, the type of regime where London decides what is best for it, and Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and everywhere else has to fall into line. However, it is clear that our economy, our needs, our geography, and many other factors are very different from the southeast of England. Therefore, I would suggest to the Conservatives that they should be less fixated with centralisation and everything everywhere being exactly the same. A bit of diversity can be a very good thing. And to turn to Labour, the Labour main myth seems to be that you can raise taxes as much as you like and take no account of the comparable rates in England and be certain that there will be no behavioural change and therefore no lost revenues. In answer to that, I would say we can be fairly sure that if we jump to a 5p or a greater difference in the tax rates at a given income between Scotland and England, there is a high risk of people incorporating, moving some of their income elsewhere and otherwise avoiding tax. But the reality is we do not know how people will react. We can study the Swiss cantons all we like with their different tax rates in a small geographical area. But there is no certainty that people in Scotland will react in exactly the same way as people in Switzerland. Of course, public sector workers will be required to stay in this country because of their jobs, and some high-paid people will feel a moral duty, as Elaine Smith, I think, suggested, to pay the extra tax. But we can be fairly sure that some people will only look to their personal advantage and will do all they can to avoid paying the tax they're meant to be paying. Now, I accept that the Jeremy Corbyn and Richard Leonard style of politics is to put the emphasis on presentation rather than content. And this has proved popular to some extent. However, when we are actually responsible for countries' finances, there is a need to be more realistic and to match income and expenditure. So overall, I consider that Derek Mackay's income tax proposals should be supported. They increase tax fairly gently, and we will see how that works. Oh. I'm asking Mr Mason, could you wind up right now, please? Okay. That was terribly effective. <laughs> My goodness. At last, at last I'm being obeyed. Uh, I, call, I call Alison Harris to be followed by Emma Harper, please. <laughs> okay, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. With the proposals before us today, the SNP, aided by the Greens, are raising taxes on more than a million Scots. The highest income tax rise for 40 years and shamefully breaking promise after promise from the First Minister and the SNP to the people of Scotland in the process. What did the 2016 SNP manifesto say on the subject of rates of income tax? Well, it said that, and I quote, we will freeze the basic rate of income tax throughout the next parliament to protect those on low and middle incomes. How hollow those words must now sound to the nurse the teacher, the social worker, or the police officer who will be paying more as a direct consequence. Well, Emma Harper. Thank you for taking that intervention. I just keep finding that the Tories keep talking about nurses, nurses, nurses. Nurses don't make the money that they are saying is going to pay more taxes. They don't. So I'd like to ask Alison to please, Alison Harris, to please clarify what nurses are you talking about that are going to be in the higher band of taxation? Alison Harris. Thank you for that intervention. I'm referring to nurses who are earning £30,000 in our NHS. Mm -hmm. yeah. and they do. Right, and nurses do earn that. The social worker or the police officer who will be paying more as a direct mm -hmm. consequence of the latest broken SNP promise. Not content with making promises on tax rates in the manifesto, the First Minister said in this chamber on the 2nd of February 2016, I have been very clear that the government will not increase income tax. In The Guardian on the 28th of April 2016, she is quoted as saying that the Scottish National Party has set out its approach to taxation, which would be not to increase the basic rate mm -hmm. of income tax or to increase the additional rate of income tax. More recently, we have heard from the Finance Minister, or, sorry, Finance Secretary Derek Mackay on the 21st of February last year when he declared that it would not be right to increase the basic or higher rates of tax for the year 2017-18 or over the course of this parliamentary session. 53 times during 2016 and 2017, SNP ministers gave that assurance that the basic rate of tax would not be raised. 53 promises broken. 
The SNP proposals to break those promises fly in the face of their own analysis, which showed that raising tax can decrease revenue. A fact that prompted the First Minister to declare on the idea of raising top-up taxes at FMQs on the 23rd of March 2016, to do it in the face of analysis that says that, right now, it could actually reduce the amount of money that we have to invest in our National Health Service and our public services would not be radical. It would be reckless. It would be daring. It would be daft. But is it not daft to raise taxes on those middle-income, hard-working families that will be hit by these proposals? By taking money out of consumers' pockets, this further risks increasing the damage that the SNP have already done to economic growth. Now, I'm going to continue. The various voices of Scottish business have made their views very clear on the effect of increasing taxes. The Federation of Small Businesses found the overwhelming majority of their members are against tax increases. The Scottish Chambers of Commerce said a competitive Scotland cannot afford to be associated with higher taxes than elsewhere in the UK. The Scottish Retail Consortium said income tax rises should be knocked firmly on the head as it could cast a pall over consumer spending, a mainstay of Scotland's economy. A consensus of opinion telling the Scottish Government that economic stimulus and growth is the way to provide funds for the vital public services that we all wish to see, not depressing it by increasing the tax burden for hard-working families. Less money in people's pockets will clearly come at a price of jobs and growth. Does the Government really believe that it is the right when all these business organisations, including Business for Scotland, have expressed such concern? An economy that, thanks to the SNP, is growing at barely a third of the rest of the UK, with missed targets not only on growth, but failing to boost producti productivity to the UK levels. Deputy Presiding Officer, SNP policies have meant that Scotland has had fewer new business start-ups and lower investment than the rest of the UK. But at this stage, I want to pay credit to and highlight the importance to Scotland's economy of the small business sector. Almost 70% of the country's 350,000 private sector businesses have no employees, often are unincorporated and thus paying personal taxes. Many of these kind of people work long and hard to develop their businesses, some to the extent that others can actually become employed. Many of these businesses are in sectors vital to rural Scotland, from agriculture to tourism. Many are already struggling. The last thing small business needs is to see the added burden of an increase in personal taxation. What a disincentive to work the long hours to provide the often vital local service to create the wealth that generates further employment. It was no surprise that in a small business survey carried out on behalf of the Scottish Government last year that the top three obstacles given by the SMEs to the success of a business were competition in the market, red tape and regulation and taxation. Deputy Presiding Officer, growing the economy is the key to economic success and keeping taxes low is a major component in achieving that growth. Whether it is for the hard-working families or small businesses, I am proud that my party will always be the party that speaks out against the undue <coughs> and damaging tax rises that every other party in this chamber has called for this afternoon. Thank you. Just finished. Thank you. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Neil Bibby. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. There has rightly been significant debate over how this Parliament uses our income tax powers, but I believe that at the heart of the Scottish Government's proposals lie the best interests of low- and middle-income earners. In the tax discussion paper, The Role of Income Tax in Scotland's Budget, the Cabinet Secretary proposed four key tests, stating that tax changes must mitigate UK government spending cuts, make the tax system more progressive, protect lower earners and support economic growth. As a member of the Finance and Constitution Committee, I'm assured that in setting out these tests, avoiding any risk of adversely impacting Scotland's economy has been at the forefront of the Cabinet Secretary's mind. Of course, I'm aware of the predictions of doom and gloom voiced mainly by the Conservative Party members surrounding attempts to implement a fairer tax system and was pleased to hear recently from the International Monetary Fund that progressive taxation does not necessarily affect economic growth. In meeting these four tests set out above, 
we have before us today is a sensible tax policy balanced to meet the needs of business while raising more for public expenditure and protecting lower earners. These plans have taken us from a real terms decline in, in that resource expenditure into real terms growth. We have a commitment that the Scottish Health Service spending will increase by two billion by the end of this Parliament to support rising demand as our population ages and an increasing share of the frontline NHS budget will be dedicated to mental health as well as to primary community and social care. The Scottish Government has also rightly chosen to continue mitigating the UK Government's cuts to social security spending to limit the number of people being pushed into poverty. If backed by MSPs, the Scottish Government's proposed changes to income tax will inject £428 million over the course of the next year to protect free prescriptions, free personal care and free tuition, increase the health budget as well by £400 million, and provide above inflation investment in the police, in universities, colleges and local government services. The reality of the UK Government's determination to continue with austerity and the very real risk of cliff-edge exit from the EU is that our economy and public services at, are at risk. By 2020, the Scottish Budget will have faced decade, a decade of cuts, a £2.9 billion cut in real terms since 2010, coupled with the cuts in the capital budget. So there is no time for you know, discussion around who's going to not benefit in this. For me, I'd like to dispel the myth that this is a, a, an issue of nurses and salary and nurses. For me, if you've got a nurse or a community ward with 40 nurses on a rota, 90% or 92% of them will pay less or the same tax. This is a budget that supports our working nurses. It means that Thank you. <laughs> well, the Westminster government determinedly marches down one road, seemingly blind to the chaos surrounding it, we must decisively choose another road. Quite simply, asking those to earn more to contribute a wee bit more is fair and necessary. The introduction of the starter rate of 19% will protect lower income earners. It's not a massive reduction, but a structural change and therefore a step in the right direction. In the first three tax bans at present, that many employees are women, 89% of nurses are women, most healthcare support workers are women, and most people providing care in the community are women. So the move to a five band income tax system is welcome from an equalities perspective because it means no one earning less than 33,000 in Scotland will pay more tax than they do now. My sister, who is one of those nurse consultants who will be making more money, is absolutely pleased to be paying a wee bit extra. She told me she's happy as long as it benefits the people of Scotland, benefits her health, benefits her education and benefits her future. So as the committee scrutinised the draft budget, one anomaly identified was in proposals from December that would have seen those earning between 43,525 and 58,500 paying less tax rather than more. So I'm pleased that the Cabinet Secretary confirmed this will be addressed by changing the higher rate threshold. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has set out a clear vision for a progressive taxation system in Scotland. And as Patrick Harvey says, if we're going to promote a progressive taxation system in Scotland, it means that we can promote a civilised society in Scotland. And that is one society that I am absolutely happy to support. I hope that members from across the chamber will join me in acting responsibly to secure the best outcome for Scotland's people and our economy. And please support this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call Neil Bibby to be followed by Julian Martin. Mr Bibby, please. Thank you, President Officer. As James Kelly said earlier, Scottish Labour are clear that the tax changes proposed today fall significantly short of what is required and will not raise the revenue Scotland needs to properly invest in our public services. We cannot and will not support the rate resolution and will be voting against it today. Members on all sides of the chamber will, of course, appreciate the importance of the link between the decision the Parliament takes today on the Scottish rate resolution and the budget itself. The standing orders will not allow us to agree stage three of the budget bill until a rate resolution motion has been accepted. However, the connection between the two major items of business 
on their parliamentary agenda this week is more than just procedural, it is also political. We cannot decide a budget until we decide on tax rates. And of course, with new powers to decide on tax rates comes new discretion over spending. The choices we make this week will therefore uh, say a great deal about our priorities and about how much we are prepared to ask those who can afford it to contribute to those priorities. For Labour, the choices made by the Scottish Government and the Greens uh, are simply not good enough. They are tinkering at the edges when the country needs real leadership, real change and an end to austerity. Last year, COSLA told us that because of inflation costs and rising demand for services, which are increasing every year, that local government in Scotland needed £545 million more out of this budget just to stand still. As we have heard, public sector workers have also faced years of pay restraint and this budget does not uh, deliver a fully funded pay settlement. As COSLA's resources spokesperson has recently said, quite simply, with no money in the budget settlement from the Scottish Government for pay, any pay rises for council workers can only come from cuts to services or council tax rises. And the Cabinet Secretary will know that only last week Audit Scotland said there were significant risks around under-resourcing of the early years and childcare expansion. Of course, there was a time when the SNP promised not just to protect public services, but to end Tory uh, austerity. Whatever test Derek Mackay may set to himself, I can tell him today that, that his budget and his tax policies uh, he's putting forward this week neither address the chronic underfunding of local services or ongoing austerity. Let us not forget the revised settlement for local government in the coming year owes more to the use of government underspends and reserves than it does to progressive taxation. And the Cabinet Secretary and MSPs across the Chamber uh, will know that cash from reserves can only be spent once. That money will not be here again for the following year's budget. After, and after accounting for changes to business rates, the Cabinet Secretary's proposals will only raise a net figure of £83 million for public services. Yes, just £83 million net figure out of a budget of 30, over £30 billion. This is significantly short of the £960 million which Scottish Labour, Labour believes is required. That's why the Scottish Government needs to come forward with a sustainable position on tax, which they have failed to do so. I haven't got time just now, maybe later. Presiding officer, throughout this budget process, Scottish Labour have affirmed and reaffirmed their belief in progressive income taxation, a case that, unlike the SNP, we made before the 2016 election. As has been said, we believe that the richest in society should pay their fair share, and so we would ask them to pay more than they do at present. It's not just a matter of raising revenue for our public services, although we are confident that it will. It is a matter of principle too. As we've heard in the Chamber before, the top 1% of earners in Scotland own more wealth than the entire bottom 50% put together. The SNP's proposals, however, only put a penny on the top rate. Our proposals not only introduce a 50p top rate of tax, but lower the threshold for the top rate to £100,000. That would expand the number of ta top tax rate payers incorporating more of the highly paid across private sector and the public sector, including directors, chief executives and, yes, Scottish Government cabinet secretaries too. I doubt they are going to move their tax affairs to England. Based on data from the annual survey of hours and earnings, someone earning £150,000 would pay £142 per week more under our proposals, but just £17.59 more per week with the SNP. Spice have confirmed that the Gini coefficient, an internationally respected measure of inequality, would fall by more than under Labour's proposals and those put forward by the Scottish Government. And so not only do our tax proposals raise more money for public services, but our proposals do more to reduce inequality, a point that Elaine Smith uh, made earlier. Presiding officer, we are clear about the need to raise the top rate of tax and we're clear about why we need to do it. Compare and contrast with the SNP government, who said barely two years ago that any tax rise for highest earners would be reckless and daft, but, we are, now, but are now adding a penny to the top rate. The same SNP government who once supported the 50p top rate, but have now voted against it eight times. It is their position that is simply inco incoherent. Presiding officer, with more financial power than ever before, this Parliament has the chance to set fair and progressive rates of taxation. 
Our proposals could generate up to £1 billion extra to invest in protecting good quality, vital public services and tackling inequality and disadvantage in our society. Instead, with the support of the Greens, the SNP government have made different choices. They are boasting about Scots paying less income tax than elsewhere in the UK, and they are also almost apologetic in asking the very highest earners to accept a modest rise in their tax bills. Here today we have heard Patrick Harvey talking about the radical changes on tax, while John Mason calls them gentle. Using, we also see the SNP consistently, in this Sturgeon Derek Mackay, using Labour arguments against the Tories and Tory arguments against the Labour Party. And what that results in is a, budget, is, is a budget that ends up looking both ways and achieves very little. And it results in those who depend on public services having to shoulder the burden of Tory austerity. For too long, this government has been timid when the country needs fairer taxes. What they are proposing today is not good enough. It does not meet the scale of the challenge before us, and it will not reverse austerity. Things need to change. We need to support under-resourced public services. We need to undo the damage that austerity has done. Therefore, we need to be bolder when it comes to tax. Thank you. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Officer, if my email inbox over the last few months is anything to go by, it's clear to me that there's very little public support for an austerity agenda and that many earners want to see more money put into vital services. Research by Deloitte has shown that support for cutting public spending to restore public finances has halved since 2010, with only one-fifth of the public now see seeing the need to make cuts. And more than 60% of people would like to see more tax raised if it means more money going into public services. Most of the correspondence that I got had variations on the phrase, I am happy to pay more if it means more money goes into our schools, our NHS, our communities. And this very morning, every single caller into BBC's Call K programme said the same. They were not particularly happy that the Scottish Government has to mitigate Tory austerity, but they were happy to pay more if their tax went into Scottish public services. The presenter, uh, in speaking to Struan Stevenson, who was representing the Tories, called him a lone voice, as not one caller agreed with his comments on the budget. And the fact is that most earners will not pay any more. Those that can afford to pay more will be asked to pay some more. But I have more faith in these people than Murdo Fraser. These people don't want apologies. They don't begrudge tax cuts to the poorest. They want better services and a progressive budget that delivers that. They look on with horror at the decimation of the NHS and other parts of the UK and firmly reject the Tory policies that caused it. They look at student debt in England and think, thank goodness for no tuition fees in Scotland. They look at the sickest people in the rest of the UK paying £8 for every item on a prescription and to coin a phrase, they say, no thanks. And they recognise the value, of so, uh, value to society of lifting people out of in-work poverty. According to the Resolutions Foundation, the UK government cuts will leave the poorest third of households an average of £715 a year worse off by 2022-2023. Uh, in a low-earning family, that's the difference between putting the heating on in winter. That's the difference between being able to feed your kids. And I'm happy to pay more if that happens to less and less families. And I want to take a little bit of exception to the phrase, hard-working families. Hard-working families are not just families that are the highest earners. It's the working poor who work harder than some of you ever here will ever know. For the 10 years the SNP led Scottish Government has already shown that it's been ambitious in the face of austerity. And despite Tory cuts, there's been record spending in both the NHS and education. The Scottish Government and the SNP have also advocated against a cuts agenda in Westminster. And nonetheless, the grant from the UK Government continues to decrease. Over the next two years, our block grant from the UK government for day-to-day -day spending is projected to fall by £500 million. And the Conservative Party thinks it's acceptable to take away £500 million from the Scottish people. Well, I don't. Week after week in this place, Scottish Tory MSPs demand increased public spending while supporting this tax, this tax giveaway for high earners and big business. You're out of step. The majority of Scottish people do not subscribe to that. Between 2018 and 2019, this budget will raise £219 million to support public services, tackle poverty and stimulate Scotland's economy. 
Meanwhile, against the wishes of the Scottish people, our economy has been put at severe risk by the ill-thought-out, badly-managed economic vandalism of a hard Brexit. The EU is the single largest market for Scotland's international exports, worth £12.3 in 2015. And just last week, the Cabinet Secretary for External Affairs, Fiona Hislop, held meetings in the Netherlands. More than £2 billion of Scottish exports pass through the Dutch ports annually. And whilst the Scottish Government continues to work hard to emphasise that Scotland is open for business, the disarray and confusion in the Labour and Conservative parties in Brexit means that our economy is even more vulnerable. And this is particularly important for my constituency in Aberdeenshire East and the North East of Scotland. A PricewaterhouseCoopers report last year predicted that Aberdeen would be the hardest hit area with a reduction in output over the next 10 years of 3.7% under a hard Brexit scenario. And when talking agriculture, Boris Johnson would do better to read the SRUC's report released this week, which made seriously worrying reading for Scotland's farmers. Instead of making embarrassing and ill-advised jokes about stagnites and carrots, he should be doing a little bit more listening to experts. Or have the Tory Brexiteers still had enough of experts? It certainly looks that way. Today, we vote to use the powers available to this Parliament to mitigate threats to the Scottish economy. Today, we reject Tory austerity. Today, we ensure the vast majority of Scots have more money in their households. Today, we ensure public services are the best funded in the UK. I'll be voting today to support a budget that makes us a progressive nation, the most progressive nation in the UK, the type of nation that the people of Scotland so clearly want. Call Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Billy Coffey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. May I draw members to my attention, a register of interests in that I am a small business owner. Alex Salmon spent a number of years trying to build the trust of businesses in Scotland. Nicola Sturgeon has now lost that trust. The Federation of Small Business say that confidence has fallen to near record lows. And today, against the wishes of local high street shops across Scotland, the SNP are going even further. The NAT taxes will reduce the take-home pay of more than a million Scots. By taking more tax from Scottish people than she promised in her 2016 manifesto, Nicola Sturgeon is reducing the amount of money that people have to spend at small businesses in our communities. The Scottish Retail Consortium has warned that NAT taxes will hurt high street shops. A Federation of Small Business survey found eight out of ten businesses did not want to see a tax rise. Even Business for Scotland have said that tax rises would not be a positive move. Scottish businesses are bearing the brunt of an SNP economy in the doldrums. And only yesterday, OECD statistics found that the SNP are growing the economy at a third of the rate of the OECD, a third of the rate of the EU, and less than half the rate of the UK. In the last quarter, the only country in Europe experiencing slower growth was Norway. The SNP-run economy is projected to have the lowest growth of any major economy in each of the next three years. I, I'll take an intervention from Derek. Derek Mackay. Hamilton believe that the UK government has any responsibility whatsoever over macroeconomic policy in Scotland. Rachel Hamilton. I would have thought it was Derek Mackay's responsibility to make sure that Scotland is a competitive and attractive place to do business, and that is the job of the Scottish government. Nicola Sturgeon is failing to meet two GDP targets that the SNP themselves set way back in 2007 when they published their first economic strategy. The SNP must enable Scottish businesses to compete with the rest of the UK if our economy is to succeed. Many interventions today have touched on how we can help grow the economy and the Scottish Conservatives have repeatedly called for the large business supplement to be brought into line with the rest of the UK and if I may I'd like to touch on this briefly. The Large Business Supplement is a deliberately misleading name dreamt up by the SNP. In reality, this is a small family-owned local business tax. Small family-owned businesses that generate wealth and employment for our local communities. The SNP's own Barclay Rates Review recommended scrapping their headline policy of doubling the Large Business Supplement. The Barclay Review recommend the SNP should match the English rate. Currently, the SNP's rate is double the rate of in England, 2.6 compared to 1.3 pence in the pound. Derek Mackay's predecessor, John Swinney, understood well the importance of Scotland's business rates being no higher than the rest of the UK. 
This massive disparity in the larger business supplement north and south of the border puts Scottish businesses at a clear disadvantage. In 2016, CBI Scotland, amongst others, the Chamber of Commerce, the Scottish Retail Consortium and the Scottish Food and Drink Federation all called for the Cabinet Secretary to reverse the decision to double the rate of the large business supplement. And prior to the 1819 budget, another letter dropped into Derek Mackay's entry from British Hospitality Association, the Scottish Licence Trade Association and the Scottish Tourism Alliance, asking the Cabinet Secretary to consider ending the large business supplement, which they describe as a hotel tax causing considerable concern to hospitality, licence and tourism venues across Scotland. Bear with me, because I will get back to how this is having an impact. Recently, over 35 independent hotels wrote to me to call for LBS to be cut. These include small businesses in my own constituency, the Driver Hotel, the Cross Keys Hotel in Kelso and further afield. Its misleading name hides the fact that LBS represents a tax on many family-owned local companies. Mr Mackay, why not allow businesses to flourish by cutting punitive taxes and giving people across Scotland more money to spend at local shops on their high streets? The Scottish Conservatives ask that you listen to the industry, lower LBS and focus on growing the economy. Now is the time to support Scotland's flourishing tourism sector and put an end to your NAT taxes and punitive hotel taxes. The Scottish Government's record on the economy is woeful and it will only get worse if you fail to support Scottish businesses. The business community is being unnecessarily picked on by the Cabinet Secretary. Their voice is yet another addition to the growing consensus that the SNP must focus on growing the economy, not taxing people and businesses. By breaking their manifesto, promise and hiking tax, Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP are creating the impression that Scotland is closed for business. The NAT taxes will drive skilled workers and young graduates from Scotland and reduce the amount of money we can spend on schools and hospitals in the future. The NAT taxes will reduce the take-home pay of low earners and struggling families. And in turn, the NAT taxes will mean people have less money to spend at their local businesses, further damaging struggling high street shops and small companies across Scotland. You can sit and snigger as much as you like, Mr Mackay, but this is a serious problem uh, with not growing the economy and it's not being taken seriously by the SNP. Yes, I will take Derek objection. Mackay. Would Rachel Hamilton say that the Scottish Fiscal Commission is totally wrong then in saying that revenues coming from our in -tax, income tax policies will increase rather than decrease then? Rachel Hamilton. Does Derek Mackay disagree with every single business organisation in Scotland that is warning against increasing income taxes which will, it, which will ensure that the economy is in the doldrums and there will not be enough money to, for people to put in their pockets to, to spend on the high streets. No thank you. As I said, we should be doing everything we can to support businesses. Instead, the SNP are insisting on making business people's lives harder by forcing that taxes on more than one million Scots. I call Willie Coffey to be followed by Kate Forbes. Thanks very much, President Officer. Uh, the Tory group have been mentioning the SNP manifesto at length today, but I, I don't recall reading in the Tory manifesto their commitment to give the DUP a billion pounds of taxpayers' oh. money. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, OK. President Officer, speaking at this point in the debate, one of the later speakers, and most of what you'd hoped to say has probably been said already, but one of the time-honoured traditions in here is that good information, facts and figures are always worth repeating, and I hope to be able to live up to that tradition in my contribution. Listening to the debate so far, it sounds like a classic going too far or not going far enough debate from colleagues in the other parties. So finding the correct balance was always going to be difficult, demanding some nifty footwork by the Cabinet Secretary. But I believe he's managed to do that, and Scottish people seem to agree with him. When asked the question by YouGov whether people supported the proposal that people earning over £26,000 should pay a little more than their counterparts in other nations in the UK and those earning less should pay less, there was a majority of two to one in support of such a proposal. With the new starter rate of 19% combined with the increase in the personal allowance, it means that seven out of ten taxpayers will actually pay less than they do this year on current incomes. And over half 55% of Scottish income taxpayers 
will pay less income tax than people earning the same amount elsewhere, making Scotland the lowest taxed nation in the UK. The Cabinet Secretary was correct, I think, to resolve the higher rate threshold anomaly that would have seen some higher rate earners paying slightly less tax next year for the same earnings. Correcting this raises us an extra £55 million, plus a consequential tax benefit of £7 million due to the public sector pay policy change. All in, the tax policy raises us an extra £219 million, and with those other adjustments to the higher rate threshold and the enhanced public sector pay policy change, all confirmed by the Fiscal Commission, means that our overall use of the devolved income tax powers ensures an additional £428 million is available in Scotland beyond the block grant adjustment. This means, presiding officer, that we can continue to support our NHS by increasing the budget yet again. We can continue to deliver free personal care, prescriptions and childcare, and we can make sure that our students in Scotland don't pay any of the huge university tuition fees that you see in Wales, England and Northern Ireland. The investment in childcare to almost 30 hours a week is worth an equivalent of £4,500 every year for every child in Scotland. That's a huge commitment being made to Scotland's children by this government, and the value of that investment will far exceed the cost of it in the years to come. And last but not least, my own authority in East Ayrshire will benefit from an extra allocation of £3.6 million agreed during the budget negotiations. All of these measures are making and will make a real difference for the people of Scotland when you compare us with other countries. When we look at changing public attitudes in the recent Deloitte survey, it appears that people are pretty well fed up with continuing austerity cuts, introduced, of course, by the Tories in 2010 and supported by Labour at that time. According to the survey, only one person in five now thinks there's a need to continue with these cuts. That's a figure that's halved in that time, as my colleague Gillian Martin uh, told us earlier. If you look at the attitudes to extending public services by increasing taxes, this was in a downward spiral since 1997 until the crash occurred. Only 43% of people supported tax rises at that point. But this has now risen steadily over the past 10 years and shows now that around 63% of people want government services extended, even if it means some kind of tax rise. That's one of the most significant changes, I think, in the Deloitte survey. And further bad news for the supporters of the UK government is that when asked if taxes should be cut, even if it meant a reduction in government services, support for tax cuts has plummeted from a relatively low 18% 10 years ago to only 10% now. So there are some stark messages for governments in the survey, but we can see at least that the Scottish government in its proposals is in tune with current public attitudes. Presiding officer, in summing up my brief contribution, I believe that the tax rates and thresholds proposed in the resolution are fair, balanced and proportionate. They ask those who earn a little more to pay a little more and, lo and they help those on lower and middle income who will pay a little less. In return, Scotland will continue to benefit from the public policies that have been put in place by this government and which have won the support of the people of Scotland. I'm happy to support the rate resolution proposals in front of us today and I look forward to the rest of this debate. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions is from Kate Forbes. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by reminding the Chamber that I am the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Whilst tomorrow's debate allows us to talk about the budget's £400 million additional spending on health, £120 million going directly to head teachers, and lifting the public sector pay cap for public sector workers, today's debate is about how we do that. And if I've learned anything from speaking to constituents and answering emails, it's this. People want to see fair investment in our public services, which everybody benefits from, no matter how much they earn, and most people can do the maths. They know that to spend more, you've got to raise more, but to raise it in such a way as to protect low earners, so as to reduce inequality and make it proportionate to the ability to pay, so as to maintain and promote the level of public services, and so as to support the public economy, all of which were the four tests the Scottish Government applied to propose changes 
to income tax. And that theory that people can do the maths isn't just based on anecdotes and my conversations with constituents. It's also backed up by polling and analysis. Every year, Deloitte and the Reform Think Tank produce a report which analyses the public sector entitled State of the State. It looks at the UK-wide performance of the public sector and public opinion. And this year's report showed that 63% of respondents across the UK, not just in Scotland, agreed that taxes should be increased if it meant the gov that government services would be extended. The figure is higher in Scotland. And that is up from 46% in 2009. 46% in 2009 to 63% this year. In contrast, a mere 10% advocated cutting taxes. Support for tax increases in order to invest in public services has grown even since last year's report. And since the Scottish Government announced its tax proposals, the Sunday Times YouGov poll confirmed that 54% support our tax plans, with less than 20% opposing them. Now, in sharp contrast, support for the Tories' continual cuts to public spending has halved since austerity began in 2010, and people are fed up with the relentless pursuit of austerity, apparently in the name of balancing the books. But in reality, the Tories have missed nearly all relevant fiscal targets since 2010. Now, I do agree to an extent with speakers and, and anybody in this chamber who argues that we need to increase the tax base. One of the greatest challenges to economic growth, according to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, is decline in the 16 to 64 population. Rachel Hamilton talked about the Federation of Small Businesses. Well, the FSB has said that the ability to hire people with the right skills and maintain trade links in the EU is, and I quote, fundamental to small firms' survival and growth. We know in Scotland that it is small and medium-sized businesses that drive the economy, and it is critical that they have access to a talent pool and to people who want to live and work in Scotland. Businesses, whether it's in the agricultural, the hospitality, or the construction sectors, to name just three, are deeply nervous about recruitment and retention of workers, particularly from the EU after Brexit. But I would say that that applies beyond the EU. It is a general concern currently about recruitment beyond the UK. In fact, it's the difficulties of securing visas for skilled workers from outside the EU right now that is actively hampering the growth of some businesses. And if those same rigid, incomprehensible rules are applied to EU citizens after Brexit, then businesses will not be able to grow, the economy will be stifled, and minor changes to tax rates will be the least of the Tories' worries. So suggesting that our relative increase for some taxpayers would be enough to single-handedly reduce the tax base doesn't wash. As the head of Tax for Scotland at PwC said, and I quote, it is an increase, but not a considerably painful one, and the money will be used to bring in an extra £164 million. Lindsay Hayward, who I just quoted, like many others, has argued that it is unlikely that people will up sticks and move their operations, and I quote, for the sake of a penny in the pound. Behavioural change is key. I agree with the Tories on that. But and targeting and efficiently spending the increased revenues from our tax plans on increased spending in our NHS, on free university education, on expanded free um, childcare will have a behavioural impact because it will attract people to move to Scotland at a time when population growth is key to growing the economy and the UK government is implementing ridiculously damaging clampdowns on immigration. Taxes are paid for by hard-working men and women in this country, and we all have a responsibility, whatever our view on tax plans are, to use revenue raised from tax as well. Today's debate shows that we are raising taxes in a fairer, more progressive way, and tomorrow's debate will show that we're investing in Scotland's infrastructure and services to create a climate for us all to prosper. Thank you.
We now move to the closing speeches, and I call Jackie Bailey. Around eight minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This debate is, of course, largely academic because the Greens have already decided to support the SNP government in their budget for the next financial year. So, indeed, the rates resolution tonight and the Stage 3 budget tomorrow will pass. So you'll perhaps forgive me if I don't spend a lot of time in this debate on the rates, the bans, the thresholds. Others have explored that in detail in their speeches. But instead, I want to look at the context in which this budget is being set. Because it is true that the Scottish Government's revenue budget has experienced a real terms cut of 0.8%. Less of a cut than they expected, maybe, but a cut nevertheless. The capital budget has, however, grown in real terms. So it is a mixed bag. But about £1 billion in the amount received is in the form of financial transaction money, loans that ultimately need to be repaid. Now, it's interesting, I have to say, that when the UK government announced this financial transaction money, the SNP were immediately critical and I think called it funny money. Now they think it's the bee's knees. Now, I am an optimist. I always hope for consistency, but sadly, I think this is a triumph of hope over experience when it comes to the SNP. But let me turn to the Tories, because their approach is simply to deny that the cuts have been passed on by the UK government and pretend that the status quo is somehow fine. And of course, you need to grow the economy, but that doesn't simply happen overnight. You need to invest to encourage that growth, and we face extraordinary pressure on public budgets that will hamper our economy from growing. Actually, it's not about taxation against economic growth. It is about doing both in a balanced and sensible way. But when it comes to taxation, the Cabinet Secretary was right, as other speakers have done, to point out that the majority of the Scottish public support paying a higher level of tax to invest in public services. But he should also be very clear. Taxpayers expect that extra money to stop the cuts and improve public services. And this is precisely where the SNP proposals fall way short of that expectation. The Cabinet Secretary and the SNP will pay a political price for this in the future. And he should be aware of that. Because the proposals before us are not bold. They're not ambitious. They fail to stop the cuts. And as James Kelly rightly pointed out, the SNP's budget only raises an extra 83 million after business rate reductions. That's less than 1%. In fact, it's 0.002% of the overall budget. You're quite simply tinkering at the edges. And let me touch on underspends. Neil Bibby was absolutely right to raise this as an issue. The SNP draft budget already built in 158 million of underspends from 2017-18. That was just the draft. Then, based on the SNP's deal with the Greens, you added in another 125 million, some from reserves, some from underspends. He knows I'm right. There are two points <laughs> that arise from this. Two points. First, it is clear that there are significant underspends in budgets. How much will he tell us? And where does it come from? Is it from housing? Is it from homelessness? Fuel poverty? Health? Which budget is it actually from? And given the increase in rough sleeping, the choice facing pensioners who are choosing between heating and eating, and the stress on our hardworking, under-resourced NHS staff, the Cabinet Secretary should come clean before the budget debate tomorrow. Can I also say to them, Perhaps he doesn't know, because he doesn't report on this until June this year. But if he doesn't know where he's getting the money from, is he really telling us he's simply guessing? Secondly, James Kelly described this as the government's slush fund. And of course, he's right. But like most slush funds, it's not sustainable. This is one-off money. It doesn't recur. So before we even begin consideration of the budget next year, the government needs to find all the money committed from underspends, of which that's at least 275 million. Now, the Cabinet Secretary might think he's terribly clever with his sleight of hand budget, but the reality is he is storing up problems for the country in the medium term, 
It is nothing but the back of an envelope accounting practice. And when you think about what this might mean in practical terms, it is shameful. Because the majority of this parliament supported removing the cap on public sector pay, a cap that the SNP consistently supported in their letters to the UK government, but I'm glad they've changed their minds. And I very much welcome the 3% increase. And whilst it doesn't restore the loss of wages, it will undoubtedly help many public sector workers. But here's the thing, presiding officer. Salary rises are not one-off for one year only. A rise this year needs to be paid for next year, the year after, and the year after that. The local government pay settlement is not fully funded to start with, but if it's partly funded by one year only money, then the cabinet secretary is fiscally irresponsible. Kozla just yesterday pointed out that money for pay should not be a one-off payment and must be built into core budgets or essential services will be cut as they go forward. So will the cabinet secretary give a commitment today? Will the money for the pay rise be built in for future years, not just for local government, but health, police and fire services? And I'm happy if he wants to stand up to take an intervention on that very point. Derek Mackay. I'll happily, I, I, rare to miss an opportunity to be given a, an intervention. Can I ask Jackie Bailey specifically, does she believe that there should be any behavioural effect on their tax plans that has produced their shoddy alternative budget? Yeah. Yeah. Presiding Jackie officer, Bailey. Presiding officer, it, it is indeed engaging when the Cabinet Secretary tries to dissemble because I asked him a straight question. I didn't get anything remotely like an answer. But let me, let me try and deal with his point. Let me turn to the question of taxation for the wealthiest in our society and whether their automatic instinct is to avoid paying tax. Now, I, like many in this chamber, believe in the need for progressive taxation. It used to be the case that the SNP and Labour were fellow travellers on this issue, at least in terms of our rhetoric. Unfortunately, the reality with the SNP is something very, very different. Because in November 2014, Nicola Sturgeon told this chamber on the day that the Smith Agreement was published that she would raise the top rate of income tax to 50 pence. In April 2015, when she launched the SNP manifesto, she said the SNP would restore the 50 pence tax rate for the highest earners. I well remember her lecturing all the UK parties on a platform down in London about how to end austerity. And part of that, guess what? Was a 50 pence top rate of tax. But when she has the power to do so, she runs a million miles in the opposite direction. Presiding officer, that is simply not good enough. Local councils have a 386 million pound shortfall in their budget. As a result, communities across Scotland are facing cuts. Cuts to children's services when we have 260,000 children living in poverty. Cuts to mental health services when people struggle to access services now. Can I say to the Cabinet Secretary, it's not a good look to actually heckle at this point. And let me say to him, cuts, well, Miss Bailey's cut, coming to close. cuts to care services for pensioners, cuts to libraries, and so it goes on. Faced with all of that, presiding officer, Scotland needs a government that is bold and ambitious, a government that will invest to grow the economy. Instead, it has a government that is timid, focused on the short term, and completely lacking in ambition. Paul Gordon Lindhurst, around 10 minutes, please, Mr Lindhurst. <clears throat> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We've heard today that our country stands at a budget crossroads, a crossroads where many options are open to us. Any of these options can significantly impact not only our future, but those of generations to come, for better or for ill. As my Conservative colleagues have pointed out, the SNP road is one of underperformance, marred with potholes of failure. An annual growth rate of only 0.6% compared to 1.7% across the UK, something the Scottish Fiscal Commission says will not catch up in the next five years. GDP growth a third of the OECD rate, as we found out yesterday, and a growth rate 3% worse than many small EU countries. These are just some of the indicators pointing to an economy under the SNP, 
struggling to keep pace with the rest of the developed world? Can we put a price tag on the toll for us on this highway of incompetence? And in response to John Mason, it is not, of course, just about economic growth and money, but the cake has to be baked before it is divided up fairly. We've heard the price tag already, an estimated 16.5 billion pounds, the cost of the growth gap from failure to match the UK economy as a whole between 2007 and 2022. The Fraser of Allender Institute has rightly pointed out one SNP favorite excuse amongst many, Brexit, is not a valid one, given that in 30 of the 42 quarters since the SNP came to power, Scottish growth has failed to match that of the UK. A decade of SNP failure for this country. So today, today we have an opportunity to set income tax rates at levels that encourage a reversal of these trends that could foster an environment in which the growth we so desperately need can take place. To begin to provide that greater tax base that can fund our vital public services. Public services which are under strain of the pressure enforced on them by a government that is determined to cut budgets, despite the block grant from the UK government increasing in real terms. This is a regressive, not a progressive rate resolution we see from the SNP government today. Instead of seizing the opportunity, we see proposals today that play to the gallery but which gallery? On closer inspection, they make next to no difference to lower income households, and they punish those that struggle to make ends meet. Before we even go on to consider council tax rises, which at only 2%, would wipe out savings from the starter rate. My colleague Bill Bowman's description of a return rail trip from Edinburgh to Dundee in his region highlights this a rail trip which would more than use up the meager 20 pound savings handed down to someone on the starter rate. Yes, yeah, certainly. Stuart McMillan. Thank Gordon Linters for taking this intervention. Uh, if that is the, the, this negative scenario that Mr Linters is actually trying to paint, actually how worse would it be if there was a further 500 million pounds worth of cuts that his party is proposing? Yeah. Gordon Linters. Um, my party is not proposing to put in cuts such as you're proposing in your question. We're proposing that the economy should be grown and the in tax take increased. As we've heard from many businesses and business organizations, that is what needs to take place. Not, not at the minute. <laughs> Meantime, Meantime, hundreds of thousands of income tax payers, the majority of whom are lower and middle income er earners, will look on bewildered as the First Minister pats the Finance Minister on the back for raising their taxes. Primary school teachers, social workers and paramedics, all now set to pay higher levels of income tax than those with equivalent jobs in other parts of the United Kingdom. Um, not at this point. If the SNP thought it was setting its sights on people with plenty of spare cash available to pay just a little bit more, it has completely misread the situation. It has already negatively impacted the incomes of those squeezed lower and middle earners when it used its new powers to offset income tax thresholds, making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK. It now reinforces its true colours by asking everyone earning over £26,000 to pay more than if they were in the rest of the UK. As my colleague Murdo Fraser pointed out in his opening speech, if that is the only income within a household covering one or two adults and children, it is not the rich that the SNP are targeting, it is hard-working families that often struggle to make ends meet. They do their best, and is this the thanks this government gives them? How can this actually work in practice? We have a recruitment crisis in general practice north of the border. How does making GPs pay almost a thousand pounds more on an average salary help? At one time, this government used to tell the benches on the left that raising the top rate was daft. And yet now, Derek Mackay is doing that 
just that, just what the Greens ask. The reality is that household savings in Scotland have dropped to their lowest level since 2006, and at the same time disposable income will remain stubbornly flat until 2020-21. Raising taxes will not turn this around. Deputy Presiding Officer, the Government does not need to take the word of the Scottish Conservatives for this. Others already quoted today have given the warnings coming from the business community. 79% of businesses who told the Federation of Small Businesses they didn't want to see a tax rise. Or the Scottish Chambers of Commerce who warned of the years it will take to repair the damage inflicted by higher taxes. So it does seem, Jackie Bailey, that they think it is a choice between higher taxation and higher growth. Is if the member is going to accept Jackie an Bailey. Perhaps, perhaps he could explain to me in this grand scheme to grow the economy, which I, I support. I think we should be growing the economy. How much it will raise? How much the economy will grow by in year one? two, three, how much additional revenue it will raise when we're faced with Tory cuts now? Gordon Lindhurst. I have already said that the dis difference is £16.5 billion pounds lost. Exactly. And what I would like to know is how much tax revenue will be lost when this budget goes through. The consequences of something that you, you not only support but say should go even further in the wrong direction. This is the pay more, get less budget, which almost two thirds of the voters at the last Scottish Parliament election didn't vote for. Yeah. Yeah. So the SNP would be wise to listen to all of those businesses who understand the importance of creating a competitive tax environment. That, as I close, Deputy Presiding Officer, is a road to economic prosperity rather than a road to economic ruin. Uh, I called out Mackay to close this debate uh, around 15 minutes up to decision time, please, Cabinet Secretary. How generous, <laughs> Presiding Officer. How generous. I, <laughs> I, I'd like to then take a moment just to reflect on Scotland's economy because I fear that some people, maybe even deliberately, have been trying to talk down Scotland's economy because on a range of indicators, a range of indicators, if compared with many other parts of the UK, it actually shows a very resilient Scottish economy. And the Tories, uh, the antithesis of Scottish enterprise and Scottish development international, should maybe promote our economy a wee bit more rather than trying to talk it down quite so much. You see, when we compare GVA with other parts uh, of uh, the UK, we're actually performing well. Yes, it's a difficult comparison when made to London and the southeast of England, but we know the UK economic model is centred uh, around that. But when you make a fair comparison actually on productivity, on GVA, uh, we actually perform uh, fairly well. In fact, productivity has improved over the period uh, of uh, devolution. Output has also uh, improved and median weekly earnings in Scotland are at £547, the third highest in the UK uh, countries and again only behind London and the South East uh, of England. And when it comes to foreign direct investment, in 2016 uh, again Scotland attracted more FDI projects than any other part of the UK outside uh, the UK uh, and London of course. Jackie Bailey. Would he pa perhaps accept that productivity in Scotland has improved only because it's measured relative to the rest of the UK, and that's where productivity has dropped. And in terms of foreign direct investment, he talks about more projects. That may be so, but are there more jobs? Because, in fact, jobs have declined as a consequence. Well, Derek McKay. The FDI projects I referred to amounted to securing over 2,800 jobs. And in relation to productivity, we have made that progress during the period of devolution. It was actually Gordon Linhurst uh, who I was surprised at when he said we should be comparing ourselves to other small, independent EU countries. Well, maybe we should if we had the powers of a small, independent country within the EU. And you know, when I've spoken, 
When I've spoken to businesses, because I actually conducted a range of stakeholder events before, uh, during and after the tax proposition, uh, yes, they raised a number of issues with me and they actually welcomed the investment that's been put into the budget around the economy and around business and around uh, innovation. But they said to me that an even greater challenge than any perceptions around tax was consumer confidence it being affected because of the uncertainty of Brexit. That's not an issue of the Scottish Government's making, that's an issue of the UK Government's making. Yeah. And I'm sorry to every member of the Tory party. You simply cannot abdicate your responsibility for macroeconomic policy yeah. when it's clear the UK Government has responsibility for macroeconomic policy, including in Scotland. In terms of the economy, the investments that we will make, partly coming from our tax plans, the investments that we will make include a 64% increase in the economy, jobs and fair work portfolio, £2.4 billion in enterprise, skills, higher and further education, a 70% uplift in funding for business research and investment and development, the new South of Scotland Enterprise Agency's initial uh, injection of funds and doubling the financial support to city region deals to £122 million. Of course, as well as the new National Manufacturing Institute, a low carbon innovation fund and the Re Reaching 100 digital programme to take super fast broadband to every part of the country, as well as modern apprenticeships and the growth of free childcare. These are all interventions to help stimulate and support our economy. And when we look at the tax plans uh, specifically and the process that got us to today, uh, the Scottish rate resolution, contrary to what a number of Tory members have said, it's been methodical, it's been well received, it's clearly been uh, considered as a fair process. The Fraser of Allender Institute, uh, yes I will. Mike yep. Rumbles. I thank the Minister for uh, giving way. I did uh, lodge a written question on this on the 1st of February, to which I haven't had an answer yet. Maybe the Minister could give me that answer. The complicated, the, you know, the more complicated tax structure we've got now, how much has that cost to administer by HMRC? Could you let us know how, what, what the difference is? Derek Mackay. I have set out uh, the costs as we understand them. HMRC gives us the final costs following the tax proposition that's agreed by Parliament. They expect the additional cost to be less than £5 million. Latest estimates are £3.5 million. I don't set that. UK Government HMRC sets that and I'll give uh, certainly the most up-to-date answer I can when we come to that uh, written question. But the manner in which we've conducted this tax debate and I actually think it's a good and a healthy thing for a government to consult on its proposition going into a budget in the way that we it did. It has public support. We know that uh, through the polling that's been conducted. It didn't ask just general questions. It asked very specific questions about the Scottish Government's tax proposal. But in terms of the way we conducted the discussion paper, Fraser of Allender Institute, we all like to quote Fraser of Allender Institute, said the government should be commended for publishing the options and their implications in such a transparent and rigorous manner. Now, the Resolution Foundation said that the Scottish Government has released an impressive report outlining in plain language the principles it thinks should drive this uh, decision. And again, in the stakeholder events, it was clear to me that people appreciated uh, the uh, engagement. In terms of other members' contributions to the debate, Murdo Fraser just can't accept the fact that 70% of taxpayers will pay less under our plan. Scotland will be the lowest tax part of the UK. Not in the right-wing way that he would like it to be uh, at all. And it's very interesting, uh, the Tories' uh, priorities uh, in that regard. Now, Murdo Fraser told me that he stood ready to vote for my budget. But you see, only if I propose to cut £556 million yeah. Yeah from our public services that this government is not willing to do. In relation to the basic rate, a majority of basic rate taxpayers will actually pay less. And as the Tories listed public sector workers in terms of their tax position, they didn't point out that those public sector workers will enjoy a pay rise yep. in the only part of the United Kingdom where the pay restraint or pay cap of 1% has been uh, lifted. In terms of the anomalies, they have been addressed over the course of the uh, constructive uh, engagement that I've had uh, with the Greens. And in terms of administrative matters, those still reserved to Westminster, yes, it is up to them to resolve them 
or not. Yes, my officials and I engaged early to ensure that they were resolved. And it's for Mel Stride, the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, to answer why it is the day before uh, this re re rate resolution is considered that he writes to confirm the way in which uh, some of these matters uh, will be resolved. But on this and so many other matters, where there's reserved responsibility, the Tories walk away yeah, from their responsibility of their yeah. UK government. But just because of these issues, it would be wrong not to use the powers to respect devolution, to turn that real terms reduction into growth in real terms for our public services uh, in Scotland. Now, there is a degree of cooperation with the UK uh, government, but they have to respect devolution and the decisions that we make uh, as uh, a consequence. Now, in terms of perceptions uh, around tax, uh, Kate Forbes was, was absolutely right in pointing out that there's been expert opinion to say that the tax changes proposed are in themselves not a reason to up stacks uh, and move. But if the Tories keep propagating a negative image about Scotland's tax regime, then no wonder perceptions will be negative <laughs> about Scotland when the reality is when the reality is that it's leading to more investment, more investment in our public services, our national health service, our economy and education eh, as well. Taxation in a fair, balanced and responsible way. Myrtle Fraser had the cheek to raise council tax. In England, council tax is rocketing compared to what's happening eh, in Scotland. But of course, no new services and no public sector eh, pay rise eh, as well. But to be fair to the Labour Party, at least the Labour Party produced an alternative budget. I don't think it was particularly competent, but all the Tories have done is suggest that we, suggest that we cut taxation by £556 million and cut public services as a consequence. You can't instantaneously magic up, magic up the revenues to invest in public services whilst cutting tax in the fashion that the Tories have proposed. Of course. <coughs> I'm, I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Let me ask him the question I asked Ivan McKee that Mr McKee could not answer and see if he can do any better. Over the years, we've heard SNP MSPs call for cuts in corporation tax, call for cuts in VAT on housing repairs, call for cuts in VAT on tourism, call for cuts in fuel duty, and call for cuts in air passenger duty. Did they once say, when they made these calls, how these cuts would be paid for? This is, this, is, this, is, this is my point. This is a serious budget, a serious rate resolution, contributing nearly £13 billion towards our public services, and that's what Murdo Fraser is reduced to. What a ridiculous position for Murdo Fraser. But you see, on, on the subject of ridicule, I would like to turn to James Kelly, who suggested that over a billion pounds extra investment it was uh, required. Now, I've already said to James Kelly before that the Labour budget just didn't add up. Income tax took no account of behavioural effects. That would reduce your tax take on income tax by around half. Tourist tax requires primary legislation. Land value tax, there's no basis for raising the figure proposed. Social responsibility levy requires legislation and use of the NDR pool. Even a Labour member, not present, has written to me at demanding to know how I would get it back into balance. You don't get it back into balance by spending it all, which was the proposal for the Labour Party. So your budget amendment and proposal has been blown apart. And all those commitments you've made as a consequence would not be delivered on the shoddy, incompetent Labour alternative. James Kelly. Thank uh, Mr Mackay for taking the intervention. He stands as a Cabinet Secretary uh, ahead of a budget where Scotland has 260,000 children living in poverty. He may rail off a whole list of excuses, but what is he actually going to do to address the fact that over a quarter million children are living in poverty? Derek Mackay. Well, as well as the new fund to protect people from homelessness, the new funds to support actions against child poverty will protect uh, tuition fees uh, that students will not have to pay, will invest in more in childcare, will continue to deliver free school meals yeah. to primary one to three children, yes. will protect people from prescription charges, will continue to deliver NHSI exams, will protect concessionary travel. 
will invest more in the NHS above inflation, will protect free personal care, will build 50,000 new affordable homes, will invest in digital to grow our economy, will we'll support a range of people through specific targeted interventions, will invest more in police and yeah, fire. That's, that's the kind of investments this budget will make, yeah. raising revenues in a fair and balanced way. <laughs> and on the subject of raising revenue, as a formality, presiding officer, I have written to the presiding officer about the connection between today's motion and the stage three of the budget bill, which of course cannot begin until the SRR motion is agreed to. But for clarity, what members have been asked to vote for today is the ability to raise all the income tax in Scotland. That will raise over £12 billion. Our policy decisions amount to £219 million, not the figures that Labour suggested, and an additional £428 million against the block grant adjustment, which of course we have to approve this before stage three of the budget tomorrow. But what the Labour Party is proposing to do is to align themselves with the Tory party and not raise a single penny in income tax in Scotland. That's what you will do by voting against the rate resolution before stage three tomorrow, allied with the Tories. Now, I know that it's Murdo Fraser's dream to raise no tax whatsoever, and by shaking the magic money tree, can spend more in our public services. I'm just surprised that the Labour Party have aligned themselves to that particular proposition. So we should respect devolution, use our powers in a fair and responsible and balanced way, raise extra resources for our public services that turn that real terms reduction into real terms growth, supporting all our public services, lifting the public sector pay cap, giving the best deal of anywhere in the UK, delivering fairness, delivering a progressive approach, one that we engaged on and consulted upon, and a tax system that charts a new course for our country around fairness and tackling inequality. We've done it in a considered and a balanced way. It commands the support of the Scottish people by two to one, and I believe that it deserves the support of this Parliament at decision time tonight and urge all members to back the Scottish rate resolution that allows us to make the investments that are required in education, in the economy, in the environment to give stability, stimulus and sustainability of our public services. And I'm very proud to move the motion in my name. Thank you very much and that concludes the debate on the Scottish Rate Resolution and we will move shortly to the question on the motion. Uh, before I put the question I would advise members that under Rule 9167, 9.16.7 Stage 3 proceedings on the Budget Scotland Number 2 Bill cannot begin unless the Scottish Rate Resolution is agreed to. Now we'll just wait few seconds to make sure all members are present. Okay, we'll move to the question. The question is that motion 10397 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Scottish Rate Resolution be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 10397 in the name of Derek Mackay is yes 67, no 50. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. 
And as the Scottish rate resolution has been agreed, the Budget Scotland No. 2 Bill can now proceed to Stage 3. Stage 3 proceedings will take place tomorrow. And there are no further decisions as a result of today's business, so we'll move now to members' business in the name of Christina McKelvey on quick credit voucher. But we'll just take a few member moments for members to change these.